Awesome, and off we go. Glad to hear everybody here. This is great. It's always it's always fun starting these things because you're like 80, 90 people, 100, 150. This is great. Got Thanks. Weeks in a row. <laughs> got a double dose of Matt Powers. It's right. always a nice thing. Awesome. Well, glad to hear everybody coming in. Welcome back to uh, Sustainable Design Masterclass. Uh, we're going to get started any second. Just let us know. Uh, tell us on the chat box below where you're coming in from. I'm coming in from uh, Berkeley, California right now. Uh, Neil, you in Utah? Still in Utah. All right. Yeah, Elaine's yeah. at her, her her homeland in Corvallis. And Matt, you're in what crazy town? You're in Washington. Issaquah. Issaquah. Nice. Issaquah. I like that name. So it sounds like we have people, people coming from Georgia, Sweden, Pennsylvania, Cyprus, UK, Tennessee, Croatia, Colorado, really rural Colorado from Daniel, Medford, Oregon, uh, New Jersey. Oh, man, this is great. literally it's like you'd probably like smatter the globe with everybody and, and we get someone here. Poland, Alabama, Tennessee. This is great. So cool. Well, I hope you learn. Who who's coming for the first time? Who who hasn't been to one of our webinars before? Uh, yeah, just tuning in for the first time for sustainable. So Jillian saying it's her first time. Jay saying me. Jay Valencia. Cool. Side Hassan, first timer. Yvonne, first timer. Sarah, first timer. Great. This is awesome. A lot of first time folks here. Laura Hello. never misses Matt Powers. <laughs> That's right. And uh, for folks who are the first time, this is going to be great. This is going to be a really good all overview of, of so many examples of restoring biology at a whole bunch of different scales. And if you're interested in more, we'll have, we have a bunch of uh, other webinars we'll send you afterwards, just in case if you want to learn more. Uh, but this is going to be a great presentation. I'll let Neil introduce the Stay On Design Masterclass. Uh, Matt, your, Matt, our good friend Matt Powers is going to introduce Elaine. And then Lane's going to get started and she's going to blow our minds. Now, uh, real quick, though, you make sure to turn off your distractions, turn off your cell phones, throw your Instagram, your Snapchat, just snap your phone in half. Snap it like a twig because you want to be present. You want to absorb this, this juicy flow of information. So make sure to do that. Matt probably can't throw his phone away. He's got an iPhone X, too valuable. Um, but yeah, be present and, yeah, excited to get started here. Uh, Oh, yeah, we're going to go for uh, about an hour and a half with Elaine. Then we have Brian Vegg here. He's a homesteader who used Elaine's methods uh, on his five acres. He started his journey as a life and soul consultant. He's got a mind-blowing example he's going to talk about along with uh, telling us about an opportunity to learn from Elaine with her classes. And then we're going to do a Q&A for as long as it takes afterwards. So it should be an exciting opportunity to learn. So, Neil, why don't you take it from, take it from there? Thanks, Raleigh. Welcome everyone to Sustainable Design Masterclass. Uh, Raleigh and I are the co-founders of this webinar series. We've been going for about two and a half years. This is our fifth webinar with Elaine. We tend to do these almost every three or four months, it seems like, but it's it's new stuff every time. The, the background information tends to be just solid soil science, but then we get into really great case studies and examples of people who have put, them stuff in, put this stuff into practice. And so we're excited to have all of you on, especially for those of you who are coming to us for the first time, because uh, this is what we do. We talk about regenerative agriculture and ecology and soil science and all this stuff. Uh, and we try to find the best people in the world who are practicing this and using this as their profession. Uh, whether they be designers or farmers or scientists or policy makers. And uh, we've got some really good stuff. We're excited to have you here. Also excited to have Matt Powers back on. Matt was with us last week doing his own webinar, and he's collaborated with us a great deal, um, as well as with Elaine. So thank you to all of you for coming. Thanks, Elaine, for coming on again, and I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Hey everybody, I'm you. Matt Powers. <laughs> I am a teacher, I'm an author, I'm a seed saver, a gardener, I'm a family guy. And I wrote this, this, this series of books, and it really was only possible 
with the information, not only you know directly applied the direct feedback from Dr. Lane Ingham, but none of this really would be possible without the discoveries that she, her husband, her team discovered early on, like decades ago. And then she took that information and developed it over time. Most people don't understand. I mean, when they talk about compost and you're like, oh yeah, I, I get it. You just add organic matter, that's great. It, it, that, that source, if you follow that watershed of influence back to where it began, you will find Dr. Lane Ingham. You will find not only like her, her discoveries, it goes all the way back to her childhood working with microscopes, following in her dad's footsteps. There, there's an incredible story here. And I've been privileged to learn about it, learn from it, and to, to benefit from it because that's what's going on. We're part, all the soil scientists, all the people who use compost all over the world owe a huge debt to Dr. Elaine Ingham. And when I started using compost, you know, I was studying Elaine Ingo, I was studying Jeff Law, and I was studying all these different things, and I was using it. And I was like, oh, yeah, I get it. I get it. I started running with it. And I just did it just the way almost everyone else does. And I had wild success. This is what happens when you start using compost and you've never used it. But it wasn't uniform. I then steered towards the things that were favored by the composting method. I was, you know, using, but it wasn't sophisticated. And so I didn't have an understanding. Instead, I did what farmers have been doing forever, right? They just kind of steered, oh, I'm gonna grow these ones, I guess. You know what I mean? And it wasn't the sophisticated understanding. And I've spent years learning with Dr. Elaine Ingham, understanding the underlying causes, the, the microbiology that influences it. And it's clear to me that if you want to understand what really needs to happen next, you need to understand it on a holistic level. And that means micro to macro. And you only get that when you get that micro too. And so it, 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 it's this missing piece in the understanding, the, the sophistication that is missing from all these backyard gardeners. And they're like, yeah, no, this was a good tomato year. Do they know why? <laughs> was it because the they did their uh, compost with this ingredient this year. This, they don't know why. They have no idea. And for people who are commercial farmers, people who are raising stuff that's going to be medicine for people, whether it's herbal or something else, this is critically important. The soil, understanding it micro to macro. And that's, you know, that's what's so exciting about Dr. Lane Ingham, because she not only can take you micro to macro, she can put it in words that everyone can understand and then pull, apply it to their specific site and their specific zone. There's no one like this because she's lived it. She's seen it go from the micro to the macro. She's seen it go from her child and understanding, working with, with animals, working with farmers, working with plants and, and, and soil, all the way to that, that macro level, to the most sophisticated level. So if you were to learn from anyone on soil life, on microscopy, on, on composting, there is no one that I recommend higher than the source. And that is Dr. Elaine Ingham. Take it away. Okay. Thank you very much, Matt. Yeah, oh, good leader. Uh, and, and, and one more, uh, we're just gonna make sure, can everyone see and hear that presentation? Just give me some ones, uh, let us know when that come in, and then we will get totally started. We'll turn, we'll turn off my, Silly, stupid webcam. Okay, great. Yes, yes. We got a lot of yeses. They can hear us. They can hear us. Russ Spear coming back and see Russ. All right. Only you're all good. Okay. Thank you very much, Raleigh. Should I turn my webcam off as well, or you'll turn no, it no. off? No, we you? we definitely want your webcam on. That is okay. Keep your webcam. Oh darn! You're going to be able to watch me all the way through. That's right. So. Here we go, the webinar. So um, I'm going to be talking about some new examples. We, of course, have been training uh, advisors uh, through the Soil Food Web um, Environment Celebration Institute, uh, training advisors to be able to go out and work with people and bring them along, hopefully, just as fast as I would be able to do that with anyone. And so we have um, accumulated a lot of good success stories 
from our advisors that are have been in training. They've finished their final project, which is to take a, an area where they've got dirt, where through chemical applications, through too much tillage, through fire, through devastating disturbances in the systems, they, that biology in the soil has been destroyed. So now, how do you put it back as rapidly as possible and typically within a very short period of time because you want to get good yields, you want to exit the weeds, you want to get rid of the diseases and the pests just as fast as you possibly can. So now you can have good yields. And so a number of examples from our advisor trainees where they are doing exactly that. And typically it takes them only one growing season to be able to do that transition from dirt back into soil. Because of course, soil is dirt with the biology, with the organic matter that's necessary um, to support these communities of microorganisms that support your plant. So next slide, if you would, please, Raleigh. Here we go, the soil food web. When we're going through this system, of course, everything starts back there with the sun. So you can look in the upper left-hand corner of this diagram. There's the sun, photosynthesis occurring in the plants. But most of the photosynthetic material, the sugars that are made as that process of fixing sunlight energy, you making carbon chains out of the carbon in carbon dioxide making those sugars, most of those sugars from photosynthesis will actually go down into the root system of the plant. They will be released into the soil and the plant puts out different kinds of sugars, different kinds of cakes and cookies, if you will, into that soil to grow the specific bacteria and the specific fungal species that the plant needs to do all the beneficial things that this food web in the ground can do for that plant. So it's going to grow specific bacteria that form microaggregates, start building structure. They're going to put out exudates, cakes and cookies to grow the fungi that will build the macro aggregates, which allows water to infiltrate into your soil. If you don't have good water infiltration, you have to start thinking about getting the structure built in the soil and that's all about bacteria and fungi as the initial steps in that process. Fungi build macro aggregates from the micro aggregates that the bacteria make. So we've got to have both of them. Depending on what plant you're trying to grow, we have to have a different balance of fungi to bacterial biomass in that soil. Depending on what stage in succession, the plant is that you want to grow. So if you're growing very early successional brassicas, very early successional grass species, you want quite bacterial dominated. As we get a little more fungi growing in that soil, then we're going to be setting the stage to grow uh, mid-successional things like the uh, ryegrass or lettuce, carrots, um, tomatoes, potatoes, things in that mid-successional stage. As we keep, as the, as the plant keeps putting out more and more foods to grow more and more fungi, because succession is occurring, we're moving from earlier successional plants into later successional. So let's say now we're going to row crops. Um, when we're growing highly productive grasslands, we need an equal balance of fungi to bacteria. As we're increasing, or as nature increases that fungal biomass in the soil, and now that we're understanding that, we have to be helping nature do that because human beings have been destroying the system for so long that we have to get busy helping nature to um, build, rebuild that soil um, for us to grow plants in. So as that fungal biomass comes along, what you see is that all of the weedy species cannot grow anymore. They either cannot germinate, they cannot compete with your crop plants, in the conditions that you've developed by getting this biology back into the soil, the weeds can't survive. And it, we go into why that is, understanding what is it that makes nitrate in soil versus what makes ammonium 
in the soil, the soluble inorganic forms of nutrients that your plant needs to take up. And of course, it's not just nitrogen that your plant takes up. It's all those other nutrients. It's, you know, nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, magnesium, calcium, sodium, potassium, iron, zinc, you know, all of the however many essential nutrients anybody wants to tell you about, your plant needs them all, just like you do. And so you better be growing plants with all the nutrients in it for you to be able to obtain the nutrients that you require to make you healthy. So going through this successional process, we really have to understand what's that ratio of fungi to bacteria and have you made the biology in your soil such that you're going to be selecting for the plant you want and against everything you don't want. So we help you a great deal understand the details of managing that. You're going to make compost to have that source of the bacteria and the fungi. Okay, so is that all you need? No. We have to make sure that those root feeding nematodes are not present. Those are the bad guy nematodes. So if you look in that second trophic level in this picture, up at the top of that column are the root feeding nematodes. How do you select against the diseases and the pests and the problem organisms? Well, you have to make the conditions in your soil such that there's plenty of oxygen coming from the above ground down into the soil where water is infiltrating properly, where roots can grow as deep as they possibly can so that all of those nutrients that the bacteria and fungi are going to supply will be plant available. So we have to build structure. So we need the bacteria and the fungi, microaggregates, macroaggregates, have to build that so water can easily move through your soil and not get hung up. Anytime you have a compaction layer in your soil, water moving through that soil, oxygen moving through the soil, the roots of your plants growing through that soil are going to stop there at that compaction layer. And so we have to be able to recognize where those compaction layers are. And we're going to have to send the microorganisms to the rescue. Build that structure. So then oxygen, water, your roots, microorganisms, the aerobic microorganisms can grow as deep down into that soil as your root systems require. And people are usually amazed when they go through the online courses, when they find out how far down into the soil the roots of healthy plants actually have to go. So we'll um, go through all of that information, help you understand how that works. So going back to the bacteria and fungi, let's move on to the third trophic level. Why are the protozoa important? Why are the beneficial nematodes, the bacterial feeders, the fungal feeding nematodes, why are they so beneficial to your plants? Why are those microarthropods so beneficial to your plants? Because they eat the bacteria and fungi that are accumulating the nutrients from your sands, your silts, your clays, your rocks, and your pebbles. It's really critical for everyone to understand this. And, uh, you know, I can't help but mention it. I can't help but go through this because you have to understand that you have no need for inorganic fertilizers when you're trying to grow plants. Healthy plants and inorganic fertilizers are the opposite ends of the scale. Every single inorganic fertilizer is a salt, and it kills the biology in your soil way before it kills your plant. It's going to kill your beneficial bacteria and fungi, protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods, and you can't cycle nutrients back into a plant available form then anymore. So you can see what the chemical companies have been doing. They've been trying to convince you to put on massive amounts of inorganic fertilizers, all these different kinds of salts, you know, lime, gypsum, ammonium nitrate, um, phosphate, um, mineral nutrients, uh, sulpomag, all of these different things, you know, potassium and stuff, in order to make certain that you are going to stay addicted to their drugs. You have to buy their inorganic fertilizer. So how do you stop? How do you get off of that addiction? You need to put this biology back into the soil. You got to get enough in the right balances, and that's where we help you learn how to make compost. Um, and then 
make certain that the balances are correct so you won't have weeds. So your plants will be protected from diseases and pests. And so there is another thing that this biology does is completely cover all the surfaces of your plants so that no disease causing or pest organism can even find your roots. They can't find the above ground part of your plant because the chemical signals, the um, uh, volatile organic compounds are no longer made and they just fly right past. If they do land, there is a good thick layer of these beneficial organisms growing and that disease or pest organism can't even get close to any of that plant tissue. So no more diseases, no more pests. You don't have to be using those pesticides. How much money could you save if you don't have to be buying pesticides or inorganic fertilizers? So um, these are the lit. This is the list of all of the benefits that you can get from a healthy food web, from getting the proper balances of bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods, the higher level predators as well. And again, we go into detail on this in the online courses. And so, you know, we've only got an hour and a half uh, to go through a lot of really good examples here. And I want to get to those examples. Um, so those of you who, um, you know, it seems like I'm kind of leaving things out. Boy, this seems rather magical. Please take the online course so you can get the information that you need so you really understand how nutrient cycling occurs. The plant puts out the exudates, the cakes and cookies, to wake up the bacteria and fungi that will go out and make the enzymes to pull those nutrients into the bacteria and fungi. Well, your plant can't get nutrients from bacteria and fungi, so you have to have predators, the protozoa, the nematodes, the microarthropods, to eat the bacteria, to eat the fungi, and because the nutrient concentration in bacteria and fungi is so much greater than what any of those predators require, that the predator has to release the excess nutrient, the nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, magnesium, calcium, sodium, potassium, iron, zinc, boron, all of those things are going to be released in the proper balances and in the right form for your plant to take up. There's absolutely no reason to put any inorganic fertilizer back into your soil. Your soil, the sand, silt, clay, rocks, and pebbles, the organic matter, have a thousands, tens of thousands of years of nutrients. There's no reason for you to be putting inorganic fertilizers on unless you really like giving your money away to the chemical companies. So all of the benefits, of course, aren't just nutrient cycling, but we also suppress diseases. We hold in the bacteria and fungi. When your plants aren't growing, bacteria and fungi are still in the soil doing their thing, but they're now just holding, keeping in place, maintaining all of the nutrients up here right where the roots will grow when you plant them in your beds, when you plant them in your agricultural fields. Because these bacteria and fungi, protozoan nematodes, microarthropods um, are still working and functioning when the rain's pouring down in the springtime or in the fall, or if you're in a very wet part of the um, world, even in the summertime, um, you're not going to have leaching. You're not going to have uh, a runoff. No, erosion doesn't happen. Uh, working with Hendrik Estraven up in um, uh, near Seattle, um, showing that a 45 degree slope that was starting to slip slide down the hill, go out there, put on the proper biology and immediately tie things back into place. Oh, you better make the right compost. You better have an understanding of what has to be in there. And that's where your microscope comes in. You can check and you can make certain that you've got the organisms to do all these beneficial things and that you've got the balances of the organisms as well. So suppressed disease, don't need pesticides. How much is that going to save you on an annual basis? Retaining nutrients so you're not losing them. Every single inorganic fertilizer that is applied is applied at high concentrations because they know that you're going to lose 80% of it. All of that stays in that system on average in general is going to be 20%. Think of that price tag, 
of that money is only staying in your soil. The rest of it is leaching out. And where's it going? It's destroying water quality. The thing that's going to take out humanity on this planet is a lack of clean water, not a lack of food. We make more than enough food to feed everybody on this planet, feed everybody a good diet. Okay, we're not so good on the distribution end of it. You know, the concentrated in the wealthy and all that. Uh, but we grow enough food to feed everybody. But we don't have enough clean water. That's what's going to take us out. So we have to stop allowing leaching of 80% of the inorganic fertilizers that are applied to agricultural fields, to homeowner lawns, things like that. Yeah, it's a... Got to get over that. Got to nut cycle nutrients, make them available to your plant. If there are toxins uh, being produced in anaerobic conditions where you've got that compaction layer, the compaction layer is anaerobic. And there are very toxic things made in any anaerobic condition. So when somebody wants to talk to you about anaerobic teas are good for your plants, no, not if it's a healthy plant. Doesn't need it, doesn't want it, and it's actually harmful. Oh, what if you have a sort of sick plant? Oh, okay, then the toxins in that anaerobic tea and an anaerobic compost may kill the pathogens. And so you'll see a positive response. But now, once you've gotten rid of those bad guys, how are you going to maintain the good? So you've got to have the compost. You've got to have the organisms to go back into that soil, build structure, hold your water, all these good things that we've already talked about. So if I could have the next slide. Quick overview of the last webinar. So many of the things that I was just talking about. All the nutrients that plant needs are in the soil. The problem is we've killed the biology through tillage, through the use of inorganic fertilizers, through the use of pesticides, and the biology is gone. It's not soil. It's dirt. So we have to put the biology back through the use of compost, compost extracts, teas. You know, why have all of these things? Well, different people, you know, want to apply this biology out in different ways. So compost is a solid. It's the best way probably to get the whole diversity and all of the foods out. But sometimes it can be difficult. So instead, let's turn that compost into a liquid form, either as an extract that goes on your soil Inject it into the soil, put it on the soil surface, but make sure that biology starts moving down through your soil. How far did the biology go? Well, that's what your microscope is for. You can't manage things if you can't measure them. So let's get that ability to know where the microorganisms are and which ones, because that's critical for you to start making a profit as you're trying to farm. So a tea. Compost teas, we're actually going to wake up all these organisms and get them to grow really fast so that they will stick to the leaf surfaces and the underside of the leaf and to the flowers and to the seed as it's being set, to the fruit as it starts to grow. We have to make sure that those organisms instantaneously stick to those surfaces so then they will protect your plant from all the diseases and pests and problem organisms. So nutrient cycling, disease suppression, building structure in the soil. We just have to get the biology back in there. So industrial, traditional agriculture, they've degraded soil for thousands of years. Um, and as a reference, see um, David Montgomery's book called, the Dirt, called Dirt, The Erosion of Civilizations. That goes through every single um, civilization on the planet before us. They are all wiped out. They all failed because they destroyed their soil and turned it into dirt. So we can't be repeating that. If you don't go back and look at history, you are doomed to repeat that history. So please let us stop now by everybody starting to understand what biology does for you in the soil and the fact that we must nurture it, not destroy it. Nukem approaches to doing things are really, really stupid. So plant diseases, pests, virus, weeds are merely symptoms of dirt. 
How do you turn your dirt back into soil? Well, we're going to go through some examples um, and hopefully you'll get lots of good ideas. But remember, it goes back to the biology in your soil. Disturbances, compaction tillage, these things fire, fi excuse me, fire. These things um, destroy the biology. And so we have to stop using those unless there's just no other choice. Tillage is a tool in your toolbox. And sometimes under very rare and unique conditions, tilling is a good idea. But most of the time, 99% of the time, you're going backwards faster than you're going forwards. It may be more convenient, but uh, how convenient is it to have to be putting out applications of pesticides every week? Uh, yeah, so we need to understand what we have to get back into the soil and why these kinds of management practices really are not a good idea. So large-scale land restoration restores the life in the soil. Um, so we got to use that starting material that's in your natural systems. Um, there's the inoculum of all your beneficial organisms so that you can grow whatever kind of plant you want to grow, uh, wherever you want to grow it. If we understand exactly what you want to grow, we can pretty much grow anything. Okay, I'll give you that we will probably never grow bananas at the North Pole. There are some limitations. We have to have soil, first of all, and it can't be frozen. So there are a few limits, but for the most part, if we really understand the conditions and we understand what your plant requires and we can get the biology back into that soil and the proper balances, you're going to be able to grow sustainably. We're going to sequester carbon every second of every day in your soil, which is something you cannot do in dirt. Next slide. So uh, what we're going to actually go over, we're going to be talking about succession. Um, you know, what do I mean when I say that? Uh, we're going to touch on compost and compost teas to help you understand um, where all this biology comes from and you know, just a little bit of a hint, hopefully to convince you to go to the online courses and take the online courses. But as um, Raleigh said, we really want to start with the life in the soil so you understand all the basics. And then we go to the practices. How do you make certain that this compost, this extract, this tea, these liquid forms of compost, how do we make sure that the biology that your plants need are in that those materials? So what are the ideal conditions? Then we have the case studies from the farmers. And um, and then, of course, uh, we will um, encourage you to um, take the online courses. I do want to point out that we will give you a password for those courses that will last a whole entire year because we realize that sometimes you get really busy and you mean to be doing the lectures uh, every day. You mean to be watching the videos every day. But, you know, lifetime just gets by you. And, you know, if you don't manage to get everything watched in a year, um, just give us a, a, a call and we'll extend the password for you. So we really want you to understand and use this information because we all have to work together to prevent us from destroying the habitat on this planet that supports human beings. Next slide, please. So this is an overview of succession. What do we mean when we say succession? Most people look at plant succession, what they can see above ground. But now let's correlate that with what's going on underneath the surface of that soil. So getting these two things together at the same time. So when we're looking at the extreme left-hand side of this picture, you can see where uh, it's bare soil, nothing growing on there. The only thing that will be present in that bare soil is bacteria. And you really are not going to grow anything if you have no nutrient cycling in that soil. So bare dirt, well, okay, it's got some bacteria in, in there, but 
it's not really soil if you have just bacteria or nobody home. So it's very, very, very difficult to have any good kind of plant production. If you're in bare dirt, um, solely bacterial dominated, you have to start seeing some fungi starting to grow. And so here's where weeds come in. Weeds come into bare soil when there's just you know a little bit of life in there to get going with. And so that very first weed puts root systems down. At least there's a little cellulose. At least there's a little fungal food in those weeds. And so see where Mother Nature has taken every bit of soil, productive ecosystem on this planet was once upon a time bare soil. And the first thing that came in were these weedy species. They don't put much effort into the roots. They don't um, do a lot of nutrient cycling. But at least organic material is coming into that system that will grow both bacteria and fungi. So we start to see a shift. We start to see those really early successional weedy species arrive. And then we go a little bit later. We get different kinds of weeds, more productive weeds. Um, the dandelions, the thistles, the composites show up. Well, most people are going to think those are weeds. They're horrible. I've got to get rid of them. And the way we get rid of them is to push that fungal biomass. Let's put in plants that will put more effort into that root system. So now we're gonna go through those early successional annual species, the brassicas, the bromes, the Bermuda grasses, the um, not so wonderful, you can't keep animals alive on a pasture of those kinds of plants, but you know they look green, they look pretty, and they are establishing more fungal biomass. So you can see that nature is pushing this system to the more productive, more productive, more productive by ever increasing that fungal biomass. Look at the ratios on the bottom um, lines of this underneath the picture. You know, we start off with bacteria at 1,000 micrograms, no fungi. Fungal to bacterial ratio, 0 0.05. Yep, you're growing weeds here, and that's it. Even with a fungal to bacterial ratio of 0.1, you're still mostly growing weeds. So now get that fungal biomass up a little bit higher. So 0.3, 500 micrograms of bacteria, 150 micrograms of fungi. And now we're growing brassicas. We're growing those early successional crop plants, if you will. Move on to the mid-successional grasses. So um, potato and tomato, the solanaceae, um, the lettuce, the carrots, those sorts of things, fungal to bacterial biomass ratio between 0.3 and 0.7. And so building that fungal biomass, building structure in the soil, building um, disease protection. By the time we're to row crops, we need it to be an equal balance of fungi to bacteria. So let's say 500 micrograms of bacteria, 500 micrograms of fungi. Move over into the highly productive grasslands. We're on the side of, you know, 600 micrograms of bacteria, 3,000 micrograms of fungi. In our orchard systems, 400 micrograms of fungal, a bacterial biomass, 10,000 micrograms of fungal biomass. Old growth forests, 75% of the volume of one gram of soil in an old growth, highly productive, some of the greatest rates of plant increase, plant production on an annual basis in these old growth cedar forests and three quarters of the weight of a gram of soil, a teaspoon of soil is fungal biomass. The USDA will tell you that's not true uh, because the USDA works with agriculture. They don't look at forests. They have no idea of the end of this successional process. So can we get soil that is more fungal? Absolutely. Nature's been doing it for the last, oh, I don't know, billion years or so. So she's had a little practice. So we want you to understand that um, what is the plant you want to grow? So you can pretty much go in here in this uh, successional chart and figure out what the plant is that you want to grow. 
Where does it occur in the successional process? And then you can figure out what your fungal to bacterial biomass ratio ought to be. So let's say you want to grow mint. All right. Where is mint found in this successional process? Go out into the real world. And where does mint occur in the real world? Where do you find it? So it's found in meadows. It's usually found in fairly wet areas around the edges of you know, where the soil is maintaining moisture. Early in the spring, not all through the year, early in the spring especially. And so we're looking at something that, that for mint, we want something between a 0.3 and a 0.5 fungal to bacterial biomass ratio. Go into the soil where mint is thriving on its own with no inorganic fertilizers, no pesticides, no need for support. Take some of that soil and look at what the bacteria are, what the fungi are, what the protozoa, and what the nematodes are. And then you know, this is what your crop of mint wants, what it requires. Um, what if you want to grow blueberries? So where do you find blueberries in the real world? Yeah, in... Um, the edges of forests. So fungal bacterial biomass ratio, find in this picture that ratio down there in, in the bushes. So 600 micrograms of fungi, of uh, bacteria and 3,000 micrograms of fungi. You have to have mycorrhizal fungi on the root systems of uh, blueberries. So you've got to find some ericoid mycorrhizal inoculum to put on and not, that's not for sale any place on the market that I know of. You're going to go have to go out into an existing blueberry area and collect some of those root systems that have the mycorrhizal fungi. Well, how do you know that there are mycorrhizal fungi on there? You're going to have to use a microscope. And so you need an epifluorescent shadowing microscope to be able to see those, to know that you've got a good inoculum that you've pulled out and you only have to be putting a little tiny bit of that root system into each planting hole. So figuring out what your plant needs and then let's figure out where your soil, where your dirt is at, what's present in your dirt. So what do you have to fix? So you go out and take a sample of your agricultural soil and you take it to your microscope and all you see in there is bacteria. So what kind of plants are you selecting for when the only thing present in your soil are bacteria? Yeah, you're in trouble. You're growing a whole boatload of weeds, which is why you have to use those herbicides. It's why you've got disease and insect and everything else problems. So how do you now move your dirt into a healthier condition so you don't have to use these toxic chemicals to try to force your plant to grow? So you're going to want to make compost. You're going to want to make things um, that have the biology required. So here's a table for you where we're, we're looking you know, early in succession, all the associated factors that are controlled by the presence of the biology in your soil. When you have strictly bacteria, it's very easy to be in anaerobic conditions, no structure, no bacteria, no fungi, no structure. Oxygen cannot get into that soil, water can't. And so all these consequences going down the line, vegetation, soil structure, nutrient status, looking down the left-hand column of this table, really summarizes for you what's going on when you're dealing with dirt, only bacteria. How about bare soil where, yeah, we got a little bit of fungi, but not much. Um, how about weeds? So weeds are the things that start to tell you that things are getting, at least you got some biology in that soil, but not nearly balanced correctly. Next slide. So, next slide. Oh, do you want to go on the the row crops or the or the deciduous trees? Just yeah, just keep going. Yeah. So here's uh, where we're looking at early successional. He's talking about Bermuda and, and bromes, vegetables, early successional grasses. Um, you know, we can just go through 
you know, we kind of went through them really fast. Um, but we have these tables and you can you get them from the um, the uh, online courses. So really letting you know exactly what's going on. Uh, when you look at the biology in your soil and you can tell what kind of plant that soil, that balance of bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and nematodes, what are you selecting for in this soil? Is that what you want? Can you get a soil that's too fungal? Well, if you're trying to grow uh, brassicas, yeah, you can get a soil that's too fungal and your plants are not going to do well. Um, what if you're trying to grow blueberries and all you have are bacteria? Yeah, you're in trouble. So figure out what is in your soil and then figure out what the plant you want to grow needs. And then use compost, compost teas and extracts to put that biology in and get it growing. Next slide. So when we're looking at um, some work by um, Renald Flores, um, his company's name, Flores Sense Systems, we're looking at the yields where he's comparing um, three different um, scenarios. So let's quick go through these scenarios up at the top of the table. Um, so he's looking at total days, days in the field. Um, so a little bit of how long it takes to grow these crops. Um, the crop name, so you can say these are, see these are a lot of vegetables. Scenario one is where he's using the chemical system, so the typical chemical agricultural system. Scenario two is where he's using um, municipal waste uh, compost, not what I would consider compost. I really think of this material that you get from most composting operations that are um, present. Um, that's not really compost. It doesn't meet the definition of compost other than it's been brought up to way high temperatures and it's been turned once a week, whether the, the organic material need to be turn, turned or not, which means that it went anaerobic. It, it's putrefied along about day three before it ever got close to being turned. Lots of toxic chemicals, lots of loss of nutrients. Under anaerobic conditions, you lose your nitrogen, you lose phosphorus, you lose sulfur. Good luck growing plants with this stuff it's more likely to kill your plants than it is to benefit your plants. And then scenario three is where this compost was made with proper biology in it. So that third title is microbiological inoculation and compost. And so looking at these different scenarios, when you compare the difference between the inoculated, the good compost with a proper biology as compared to the conventional system, you can see the increases in yields. 73%, 87%, 109%. And this is in the first growing year. This is where you're working on getting the biology to the right place. Every year, you want to get it closer and closer. What we've seen and the experimental farming in California is on the first year that we uh, put crops into the ground, no biology plus biology, that the plus biology increased in yield by on average 50% over you know, the 30 different crops that we were growing. 50% increases in yield. In the second year where the biology got even better in the plus biology side, we increased yields by 300%. And in some cases, a thousand percent. So what's it going to be this year? Yeah, stay tuned. We'll let you know. So you can see these differences. Um, the last column in this one, the pink column, um, is the percent difference in scenario two with uh, questionable compost versus um, the uh, the um, third scenario one. So you can look at those different comparisons. Picture from Renald. Um, gorgeous, the plants. Um, every one of us would want to be um, having yields that look like this. Next slide. So
So potatoes, uh, I love the, I love it when somebody puts an E on the end of potato. Um, okay, so um, Brazilian, uh, Portuguese. So let's see, scenario three, here's the plus biology um, with the full diversity of the beneficials um, versus scenario one, which is no input, um, and scenario two, which is uh, putting in commercial compost. You can see with scenario one that there's a lot of disease, there's a lot of problems, the sizes of the potatoes are all much, much smaller. Um, with the commercial compost, this was not a good compost. This did not contain the biology that you want and the difference between scenario one and scenario two is minimal. So um, getting the nutrients, um, dealing with the diseases and pests, these are our expected benefits, and we're showing time and time and time with all of the SFI advisors as they're doing this work, they're getting these same kinds of results. So next slide, if you would, please. Um, we can um, want to do nutrient concentrations. That's uh, something that I want to continue to do so we would have nutrient um, information. This shows the difference in the biology when we're looking at scenario one versus two, versus three, you can see that um, we have uh, really high levels of bacteria in um, scenario one and two, and much lower in the proper balanced uh, compost. Um, that fungal to bacterial ratio is much more fungal, but it still needs to be increased. These are potatoes. Potatoes require something that's more like a 0.7, and you can see that third row down is that fungal to bacterial biomass ratio. It's really horrific in scenario one. And of course, the yields weren't good, the soil was compacted, ciliates and root feeding nematodes were present, good indicators of um, anaerobic conditions, compacted conditions in that soil. Scenario two, um, the um, Fungal to bacterial ratio was 0 0.07. It's up at 0.13 in the scenario three. And look at the difference. We were just in the last slide, we were looking at that difference in yield and um, appearance and improvement, uh, reduction in um, diseases and pests and size of the potatoes were better. So this is the kind of data that we want to help us understand how far have we come along? How much more work do we need to do? Well, even with slight improvements in the biology in your soil, you're going to be getting increases in yields of 50 to 100%. Keep going. Next slide. And of course, if you um, talk with Renald, he can... Um, go over some of these results with you. So here's from his onions, where he's, uh, you know, here's the scenario three with the proper biology over on the left-hand side, um, scenario one with no, uh, no biology added into the system, and then the commercial compost where clearly the commercial compost had some diseases in it. And so you're harming your plants more than you're helping if you don't understand the biology that this plant requires and that there were some specific onion pathogens in that um, putrefied organic matter. I Myself, I would not um, contaminate the term compost by calling that material compost. It's detrimental if you're not checking it and making sure that the beneficials are present in that compost. So next slide. Onion yield results when we're looking at the actual biology. So again, looking at that fungal to bacterial biomass ratio, scenario one with no added biology in it, really bad. Mm, what does um, onion require? Well, onion is earlier successional than potatoes are. So potatoes need around a 0.7, 0.8. Um, whereas onions, they're down around a 0.5. So again, we're not the um, improvement in the biology in these um, soils isn't complete. 
but he is getting significantly better results. When you're looking at a fungal to bacterial biomass ratio of 0 0.004, there's almost no fungi in there, no beneficials in there to speak of. Um, scenario two with the uh, not so wonderful um, putrefied organic matter, uh, 0 0.06. Uh, well, it's better than no biology, but you can see where you would sometimes have not a negative uh, impact versus where good compost with the right biology was added much closer to the desired level, but there's still some more improvement that will occur. So next slide, please. I'm assuming you're all looking at all of the rest of these tables and having fun ferreting out little facts and information, but you know, I, 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 I'm talking too long, so we've got to get going. So um, this is with um, uh, with um, celery, and again, look at the size of the root ball. There's really a huge difference in these three um, different managements, and it's extremely visual. You can see the benefit. We don't have the yellowing leaves. We don't have the um, you know, shorter stems. So a lot more production where we have the proper biology. So let's keep going. Do you see the fennel? Yep, so here's the fennel. Um, same sort of thing, the, the data are on the bottom underneath the picture. So we're, we're looking at the um, size of the base, how much larger it is where we have all the proper biology. Um, not nearly the size, significantly less, and diseased roots on the fennel uh, with uh, scenario one and the scenario two with the not so wonderful uh, organic matter, uh, again, diseased root systems. So 140 grams sellable weight with biology and half of that in the control, just about half with that um, not so wonderful organic matter. So next slide. I think will be the biology in those systems. Ah, okay. So there is information from Anald. Um, he is just finishing up his certification. So with those kinds of data and the biology information, he's going to get that certification. And so he's already um, set uh, to start working with other people who want help um, going through these kinds of conversions of their dirt back into soil. Now we're going to shift to grasses, um, parks, pastures, so um, equal biomass of fungi to bacteria kind of systems. So next slide, we're going to be looking at uh, the compost tea trials at a dairy that we were we worked at in New Zealand. Um, in this, uh, what they did was half of the farm stayed in the conventional chemical application mode, half of the herd stayed on that half of the property. The other half um, of the herd stayed on the other half of the property. So this is like a 300 hectare dairy split in half, so 150 hectares on one side, 150 hectares on the other. In an acre on each side, the grassland was fenced off, so we could measure the increase in yield, uh, and we could uh, get a nutrient concentration in this plant material. So um, next slide. I'm going to try to hurry through this just a little bit. Um, inside those one acre um, areas, the grass was mowed every time the, um, there was enough grass to mow, and we collected it all, weighed it all, and then do nutrient concentrations. On the half of the farm, um, we applied three applications of compost tea and foods. Well, the foods are the new, the um, foods that you put into the compost tea to grow the organisms. 
um, and at a very low concentration, you know, 150 liters per hectare, which is what about 50, um, it's going to be 50 liters per hectare. So very small amount. What is that about um, 10 gallons per acre applied every four weeks to, starting in October. So October 1st, November 1st, December 1st, January 1st, oh, no, just three applications every four weeks. So October 1st, November 1st, um, December 1st, only those three applications were applied to all of the pasture on the plus biology part of the farm. The other part of the farm was conventionally fertilized with urea at the rate of 75 kilograms per hectare, which is more or less 75 pounds per acre of urea every six to eight weeks at a total of 450 pounds per acre through the whole entire growing season, which I know seems a, a little bit high, but that's normal rates. That's what is recommended for that part of the world. And then, of course, Sopomag was applied. Um, if I remember correctly, that uh, was something like 15 pounds per acre at industry maintenance because they do have a problem with magnesium and sulfur typically in these soils, so putting out sulfomag. So comparing the results from these two different kinds of managements. Next slide. Shows that uh, the total dry matter was a full ton greater where the compost tea was applied. Now, I do want to say that um, for a whole entire year before we went into the plus biology treatment, absolutely no inorganic fertilizers, no pesticides, no nothing, no herbicides were applied on the plus biology side. And yet the quality of that hay was significantly better. There was significantly less weed in this additional you know, higher yield by an entire ton through the um, that uh, three months of testing as compared to the chemical side. So what does that tell you about what the pesticides and the inorganic fertilizers do to select for or against the problem plants that you don't want? So next slide should be looking at, yes, a lot of clover was coming up. And, of course, the um, the uh, veterinarian for the farm was very concerned. He was actually extremely concerned that as all this clover was starting to grow on the plus biology side, um, that that would cause an incredible amount of bloat in the animals. We had no bloat at all on the plus plus biology side, even though we increased the percent of clover from almost not visible to being 50% of the stand, quite visible. Uh, we had no bloat, no problems with the animals on the plus biology side. The place we still had, they had bloat. There was still a problem with the digestive system of the animals was over in the, in the chemical side, in the conventional management system. Well, urea, if it's eaten by the cows, causes serious bloat problems in the animals. Now, one thing I did not mention, mention in this um, treat in this um, experiment was all of the animals had facial eczema. Um, we tried to split it so that there was the same amount of eczema um, and same um, degree of severity in the no biology versus the plus biology. So. The herd was split up on that basis. So facial eczema was equal on both sides. Facial eczema is a muscle wasting problem of the muscles in the face, in the jaw. And as the uh, disease pro progresses, um, basically all of the uh, muscles in the jaw region atrophy. They stop working and the jaw, the animal falls off. And of course, if you can't eat, you're going to die. So it was a horrible problem in New Zealand when we first started working there. Um, and, you know, I was like, I, I'm not a veterinarian. I don't have any idea of, you know, what animals need. So I, that's why we made sure that we had an equal amount of eczema on, on both sides. So next slide. Just to let you know that we were starting off with that condition. Um, 
so this is the next example coming up, but I want to finish up with um, the nutrient concentration in the plant material on the plus biology side was massively increased. And high levels of uh, selenium and um, uh, one other nutrient I'm not going to remember, uh, much higher in the plus biology side as compared to the no biology side because the no biology side did not contain any detectable levels of those nutrients. All the animals on the plus biology side recovered from facial eczema. None of the animals on the conventional side recovered. And what that tells you is that on the conventional side, the plants are not, even get, not getting the nutrition that they require from that soil. And so the animals were dying. They were suffering from a mineral deficiency. As soon as you put the biology back into the soil, the plants are going to get all the nutrients, all of the minerals that they require for the animals and for you to get the nutrients that you require. So now let's go on to this example from Camperdown Compost in Australia. Um, this was um, an area where um, all of these growers were, well, really close to bankruptcy. They were about to go under. And so they were quite willing to try something, anything. And when we suggested that we would take all of their waste manure from their manure lagoons, um, turn it into really good compost with all the right biology, and then they could use that compost to go out onto their fields. And you can see on the, um, in these pictures, you can see examples of what these um, pastures look like um, after a very short few number of applications compost going out with compost extracts as well. Um, you can see what the pasture looks like on the far left. Uh, you can see the amount of clover that was coming up in here. And again, same story. The veterinarian was just, oh, my God, you're going to lose all kinds of animals. No, we didn't lose any of the animals because it's the chemical high levels of uh, conventional chemical uh, mineral materials going out that that's what's causing the bloating problem, not the appearance of uh, or lack of clover. That's not the problem. There, the guys in the middle were looking for nodules on the root systems of the clover, and there were thousands of good nodules fixing nitrogen. So the clover was um, putting um, nutrients into the um, into the clover. People often get that wrong. That um, nitrogen fixa fixation is going to be putting nutrients into the soil, not directly. Um, the plant's going to get nutrients, going to get that nitrogen from the nodule only after the bacteria forming that nodule has made all the protein that those bacteria require. Then they give to the plant. The plant doesn't release that out into the soil. The plant uses all that extra nitrogen to grow more plant, bigger and more beautiful, taking up more space. And, of course, the cows love it. They absolutely adore um, good clover that uh, is functioning normally and not stressed. Um, so the animals are all healthy. healthy. They're um, increasing yields, uh, heat, <clears throat> herd side, size. They're not having to put any inorganic fertilizers, no urea, no sulfomag, none of the typical things that you have to add into a uh, pasture in order to make it grow. You just got to get the biology back. The th uh, third picture over on the right-hand side is a picture of the neighbor as compared to the plus biology. Neighbor was putting on inorganic fertilizers. The neighbor has not been able to graze that pasture because he's not getting enough growth. Whereas on the plus biology side, it's been grazed seven times since the season started. So who's going to make money here? Who's going to be able to pay all their bills. Now, when we first started with these growers, they were going bankrupt. By the time we were um, saving them, they didn't have to spend on the veterinarian bills. They didn't have to spend uh, on the inorganic fertilizers. They didn't have to spend for the um, 
uh, pesticides for all of the you know growth hormones and all of the chemical things that they were told thank you um, were going on um, and they could graze more animals they all increased their herd side size um, they were making money and I love it when you're working real hard with these guys and after the second year what do they do with all that money that they're making they don't pay us more they go and put a swimming pool in. <laughs> oh, well, they deserve it. So next slide. So some of the results, you know, when we first started working with them, they would have to re-sow their pastures every year or every two years. And uh, because the cows, when they were grazing in the conventional system, the roots were so short, the compaction was right up there at the surface of the soil. So that... Um, when the animals took a mouthful, you know, wrap their tongues around the grass and pull, they were losing plants, roots, and all. So they had massive bare spaces in their pastures. They were losing nutrients. They were losing soil. Um, and so they were resowing their um, seed every year or two, which is enormous cost to them. Um, nitrogen use was reduced in the first year. Some of them were kind of like, oh, can't quite let go of our um, fertilizer. So they only went halfway. Well, ultimately, if they went, you know, whole hog, um, they said we saved the growers $200,000 in the first growing season. If they still wanted to put on inorganic fertilizer, it took a year only reducing their cost by 100000 and then in the second year, they would typically reduce the fertilizer by another 50%. And by the third year, they were saying, why am I wasting my money? Get rid of this inorganic fertilizer stuff. It's not needed. So they didn't have any diseases, no insect pressures. Their, their fertility increase, increased. Um, their stocking rate increased. Um, they bought more animals or they kept their heifers and um, raised them. And, of course, their mycorrhizal fungi increased from 4% in the chemical world to 87%. And mycorrhizal fungi go out and collect at the request of the, of the plant. Mycorrhizal fungi go out, pull nutrients from the sand cell, clay, rocks, and pebbles, bring them back, and trade the plant. Those mineral nutrients that the plant requires for photosynthate from the plant. So huge improvement. Um, the first year we worked with people, I think there were three or five. I think there were three in the first year. There were five growers in the second. In the third year, it was 75 because the information started getting out to all the dairymen in um, South Australia. Um, and by the next year, um, we were working with 275 people. And, you know, it's at the place where... Camper down compost, usually um, the guys working there just, they won't even answer you in the beginning of the growing season because um, they're just too busy. They're, they have just too many clients. So um, go work for them if uh, you have that information, if you have this knowledge about the biology and how to improve it because they've got clients that they need to have people helping them. Next slide. Okay, specialty crops. People often, you know, look at, you know, we work with a large acreage, huge size farms. Um, fine, we can do large size, we can do small size, and every size in between. So we have been working with cannabis and with hemp. Um, what is the proper biology? What is that balance of fungi to bacteria, protozoa, and nematodes that you need for cannabis? Are you trying to grow the, um, you know, the THC or are you trying to grow the medicinals? Uh, when we're dealing with herbs of any kind, how do you increase the medicinal quality of that plant as opposed to in the conventional chemical system where you're just not making the medicinal um, material? Uh, you've got to get the right biology in there. And is it going to be something that's more bacterial or fungal or more, you know, do you, how much nutrient cycling do you have to have? So these are some of the questions that we're working on. We have quite a few experiments going right now with um, cannabis where we're looking at um, if you're trying to 
um, produce something high in THC or if you're trying to produce something that's high in medicinals. And of course, most people are choosing medicinals because you make more money that way. Um, and so we know what that ratio needs to be. And we're even getting into the point where for different cultivars of cannabis, what is the pro proper ratio? So doing that kind of work. Uh, bamboo, you know, flowers. So when looking at the lavender there, um, cocoa tea, fiber. I was just up at a tea plantation, not yesterday, but the day before, um, looking at their production and kind of going through all of their um, tea bushes and going, you've got so much disease in here. Let's let's get out here with the proper biology and fix this right now because you don't want to be having that reduction in yield uh, if you don't have to suffer that reduction in yield. So next slide. Next slide. Oh, is there it coming up? Yeah, yeah finally. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm just really my computer. Ah, this is Corvallis and uh, Comcast. Urgh. So orchards and forests, um, compost, compost trees. You know, we um, try to, we, we have a typical routine. Here's what we do in the first year. And then we see how much the biology comes along in the right direction. All of these situations that we're looking at here require fungal dominance. So it, whether we're looking at banana or we're looking at pineapple or we're looking at um, avocado or just mature forest systems, they need to be fungal. Um, and so let's get that proper compost out there. Let's get the understory so that the understory plants here are also fungal dominated because then they will maintain the proper biology so that as soon as this plant starts growing, your crop plant starts growing at the beginning of the growing season, immediately they're into maximum mode. Whereas, you know, you put something into the area below your plant that is more of a bacterial or, you know, like a 0.5 ratio of fungi to bacteria, 0.8. That's not really helping your plant. Well, it's better than bare soil, that's for sure but it's not helping your crop plant as much as you would want. So we've been doing work here for a number of years. If I can have the next slide. Um, I believe we have, oh, uh, this is Christmas tree where um, we were working with a grower that had needle cast problems. So it's a fungal disease. Um, they had the chemical treatment. Um, so one of the rows would be chemically treated. The other would be plus biology. In the first growing season, we didn't see much difference. But look at below ground. Look at the root systems. So uh, to the, the picture to the right-hand side, um, you can tell immediately which one had the compost tea, which had the proper biology being put into that root system versus the chemically grown one where those roots are long and they're searching and they're desperately trying to find the nutrients that they require, you look at the root system on the one on the left and, uh, you know, massive amount of small root tips, they're taking up all the nutrients. In the next growing season, the plants on the left-hand side grew two years worth. Um, in their, so in their third year, they grew um, twice as high as the chemical ones. In the fourth year of production, again, they did two years worth of increase. So at, I believe it was six years, the um, six to eight years, the um, six at, at six years, the, uh, the ones on the left could be sold. It could be cut and sold as mature Christmas trees, whereas it took another four years for the chemically grown ones to reach the stage, reach that sellable stage to um, go out on the market. So of course these people went crazy. Um, they no longer had needle casts. They didn't have the weeds in the system. They could sell their product at half the amount of time um, and they were beautiful trees. Now, notice I don't have pictures of the next stages because 
once these guys figured out that this was for real, they wouldn't let us have the pictures because they didn't want anybody else to know how it was they were achieving this kind of growth. Er. So next slides. Composting systems, you know, it doesn't really matter uh, whether you're doing small piles like the top picture or large scale, massive amounts of compost being made. We can help you out both sides. We just have to get the right biology. And to get the right biology, we need to have a diversity, high diversity of food resources going in here, high diversity of the sets of organisms going into these piles. Um, small scale for gardeners, uh, large scale, you name it. Um, we can help you out on the commercial end or the homeowner end. You know, um, good compost should look nice dark brown, like in the bottom picture. Yes, it's a commercial operation, nice dark brown color. Um, people often look at the steam coming up off that um, windrow and go, oh my gosh, your compost is burning. No, that's just steam. The steam is uh, generated anytime the temperature in your compost pile is more than 15 degrees higher than the ambient temperature outside. It's just telling you you've got nice, toasty, warm compost. So do you have the biology in this or not? And that's what the whole compost class is about, is to help you understand small scale or large scale how to produce the compost that has the organisms in it that you need to get back into your dirt so you can convert your dirt back into soil. So, of course, a good compost is worth its weight in platinum uh, because how much money can you make if you can increase your yields by 300 to 1,000 percent. So let's do it while reducing costs at the same time. Next slide. Compost tea systems or compost extract. Um, we're going to turn the compost into a liquid um, form. And, you know, which kind of tea brewer do you want to buy? You want to buy something where the volume of extract or tea that you're producing is what you're going to need to put out on your fields. Now, you are probably not going to be applying um, compost tea or extract to all of your fields all in one day. So work it out where it's, you know, how much am I applying each day for two days or three days and reduce the size of the equipment that you have to have. We want to work with you pretty closely on what's the kind of equipment that you need to have for the production that you want to have. And how much are we going to have to work really, really hard to do that conversion of the biology in your soil uh, conversion with the biology in your dirt into soil. And, and so here's where we've got to get kind of one-on-one. -on -one. What do you want to do with the plants that you want to grow? What's in your soil to begin with? So we make this conversion as rapidly as possible. You know, human beings, we are so subject to this idea that if a little is good, more is better. So instead of only putting uh, a tablespoon of fish hydrolysate into my tea, I'm going to put a gallon into my compost tea. Well, you just destroyed it all because it's going to go anaerobic. Microorganisms start growing really, really fast on all that good, juicy protein and sugars and wonderful stuff. And they just start growing so fast that they use up the oxygen faster than you can possibly pump it into your tea brewer. So we want to work with you and make sure that you understand the pitfalls, um, why this is, is so good and where it is you can mess up really, really badly. Um, and, you know, just throw your hands up and say, this compost tea stuff doesn't work at all. I'm going to um, sell all this stuff and go back to the chemical system. And I'll uh, call us in when you're having those kinds of problems or hopefully learn right from the very beginning um, how to avoid these particular traps. Next slide. Monitoring biology with a microscope. You can't manage if you can't measure. 
So how do you know you have the biology that you need to have? Microscope. And there I am staring through the microscope. This is, I don't have to be all dressed up in a white, um, you know, lab suit. I don't have to have a respirator on my face. I need a pipette. I need, um, you know, a stirring spatula. Uh, I have to have a few test tubes. That's all you need. Um, typically, you know, you're making a compost tea, you just walk outside with your pipette, pull a sample from your tea brewer, put a drop on the microscope slide, the rest of your sample goes back into the tea brewer, and you walk back to your microscope, cover your drop with a um, cover slip on the microscope, and there I am determining whether this compost is ready to use, or this compost tea is ready to use or not. It takes you five seconds. Well, you've got to be trained to recognize what you're looking at. So when you look at the creature in that lower picture, is that a good guy or is that a bad guy? Should I be feeling good that I'm seeing this organism or should I be very afraid? And we got to teach you that. We've got to te teach you what the bacteria look like, what the good guy bacteria, what the bad guy, uh, who are the good guy fungi, what do the bad guy fungi look like? What do good guy protozoa look like? What do the bad? What are the good nematodes? What are the bad nematodes? The, you know, all of that. You then learn what management you should be doing when you're seeing what's lacking in your soil. When you see what's lacking in your compost, you're going to have to fix that too so you can get the biology back into your dirt and turn it back into soil. So you can reduce your costs. You can be making a lot of money. So that's the microscope class. Um, we have um, microscope classes at the farm, but I don't like to teach people just about the microscope because then you don't know why um, these kind of bacteria or these kind of fungi are good or bad or indifferent. You, you need to know um, how to interpret the information that you're seeing. So go through the life in the soil class, how to make compost, how to make compost tea and extracts. And that's why we teach you the measuring um, methods at the end, because then you really understand why it's critically important for you to be able to have this way to measure what's going on. How can you figure out what's going on if you just, oh, it's like, I'm going to wave my hands over this and I'm going to say, yeah, this is very bacterial dominated. Ooh, you're going to have to work really hard with me to get that um, fungal compost up or, you know, wave their hands and, oh, yes, we did a great job working with you. Lots of fungi in there. Really? Could you demonstrate that to me? Next slide, please. So here's an example from Shane. Uh, Plath um, working in um, South Africa. And so, Raleigh, am I going through this or is somebody else going to go through this? Oh, okay. Well, if you want me to go through it, I can. It really depends on what you'd rather do. It's up what to you. What do you feel like? People well, might if, be if, really bored listening to me. <laughs> I, come on. If you're bored with the lane, <laughs> type in one. No. <laughs> I, I think they'd, they'd love to hear you. Do it if, if you're okay. cool with that. What does everybody think? I think people would probably want to hear you talk about okay. it. Am I right? Am I right? <laughs> I want to hear more of a link. I want to hear more of a link. Not bored. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so okay. lots of okay. Okay. for a link. So I think we have our answer. Thank you. So Shane is one of our um, Soil Food Web advisors. He's in training. He's just finished up this work um, in on his um, farm where banana is the main crop, but he's got a number of other vegetable types of crops. And so he did this work in both the banana as well as in his vegetables. And so finishing this up, he's got the biological data. He's got, you know, here's the plant production. So this is a good example of the kind of project we would want you to do to meet the requirement to be billed as a soil food web consultant, a soil life consultant. Um, so um, Shane started out suffering a lot of loss. And, and so you can see 
uh, what the banana plants look like on the left-hand side, and it's got the little title in there, Struggling Plants, December of 2015. And um, as an organic grower, he was very frustrated. He wasn't making very good crops, uh, not very good production, all kinds of diseases and pests and just not getting what he wanted. So he was thinking about going back to uh, the conventional system because, you know, you got to make money. Well, that's the problem with the organic world. They don't explain exactly why it is that organic agriculture works. And it's all about the biology in the soil. If you really do organic agriculture correctly, if you really have the patience, if you let things get kind of bad and then you, the biology starts coming in hopefully on its own, um, it will eventually. Um, you know, how long is it going to take Mother Nature to get this biology back? It, it could take her three years or 10 years or 100 years. So a lot of organic growers just they don't have that kind of time to wait for Mother Nature to get around to it. There's no source of good biology anywhere near their farm. So it doesn't matter how much organic matter you get on the soil surface. It doesn't matter that you're doing, oh, everything you think is right. How do you know whether you've got the biology? Yeah, microscope. So he was thinking about going back to the chemical system, and he really didn't want to do that. It, he knew the dangers, and he understood the problems with those toxic chemicals. So his farm, the farm workers were in jeopardy, and he just hated to do this. So he started looking around, and he came across the work that I was doing and did, took the classes and started to follow um, this process of getting the proper biology back into the soil. And so uh, really started working on it in 2016. So here you are in June of 2017, which of course is um, harvest time in the part of in South Africa. And you can see his bananas. Look at the difference. So the next slide, I think goes a little bit more into the story of this. Um, so you can, you can read his story up there. He was making compost because in the organic world, you're supposed to make compost as the means of fertilization, but they don't tell you how to make it properly. So it smelled really bad. It was anaerobic. Um, when you have all kinds of fly larvae being laid in the compost and you can see fly larvae in the um, putrefied organic matter, it's not really compost. Um, that's actually conditions where you're making some very toxic materials. You're making a lot of acetic acid, too, way too acidic. You're um, producing alcohol, and that will kill the root systems of your plants. If you put it out and there's still alcohol in the compost, or remember that the organisms in an anaerobic situation, even though you may fluff it, even though you may mix that, got oxygen in there, the alcohol dissipated, but now you put that anaerobic material onto the surface of your soil, the anaerobic organisms in that material are going to immediately start making alcohol and other toxic materials. So it can be very detrimental. Putrefied organic matter is very detrimental to the plant. So he was seeing a lot of disease. He was seeing a lot of damage. Um, he was putting on potassium sulfate, which to me is like, how can that be organic? Potassium sulfate is a salt. What's natural about that? Uh, blood meal, lime, what's natural about that? Um, gypsum, those are both salts. Uh, manure, well, what's the quality of your manure? You really need to compost any manure so you get rid of the human pathogens and you get rid of the salt concentration that quite often comes in com commercially produced cow manures or horse manures. Cedar wood chips, yep, but with a cedar, you've got to make certain that the cedar um, volatile organic carbons evolve off because those are antimicrobial agents. So you've got to make sure the smell from any wood chip is gone before you actually use it. 
So he's using all these materials, not being successful. So he found uh, my work, you know, and, and started to learn. Next slide. Started to learn how to change his production. You know, there's December 2015. Does that look like a banana plantation? That's pretty horrific, isn't it? Um, you know, and here we are then in June of 2017, hugely increased yields, got rid of the diseases and the pests. Well, he's not come as far as he can come. This will continue to increase over the next several years. When we were working in Australia, we had um, several banana growers that we were working with, but the one that comes to mind for me is um, Graham. Uh, it, uh, in Coffs Harbor, can't remember his last name right off the top of my head. But um, when I went out to visit him first, and I looked out at his production field, I didn't even recognize that those were bananas because they were even shorter than what Shane was showing is showing you here in December of 2015. To me, the little banana plants look like. Um, something from outer space, uh, had no idea what those plants were because they were so um, deformed. They were so unhappy. They were so unhealthy. So got them to start making really good compost. Yes, they were organic, but they weren't making the compost right. Got that through that information through to them. Take all of the um, grass away from the base of the tree. Remove all of the um, weeds and put in a good inch, inch and a half, if you can manage it, two inches of really good, extremely fungal compost as you possibly can get it. And within one growing cycle, all of the diseases, the pests, the beetles eating their way through the um, base of the trees, gone. And they started producing bananas again. So I have pictures of the base of the hill, looking up at the top of the hill through the banana plantation, where you could very clearly see the farmhouse up at the top of the hill. And six months later, taking a picture from exactly the same place, looking up towards the top of the hill, and you would never know that there was a house up there. Because the bananas came back. They had beautiful bunches of bananas uh, to just... Got to get the proper biology back into that soil. Stop killing it. And even in the organic world, we will kill things. So got to get got to get that part of organic mm, pulled back around so people understand what's important. Next slide, please. Um, monitoring, critically important. You know, what's on the grass? So you look at them harvesting the grass and, you know, they needed a lot of tonnage. So they actually took one of their fields in order to grow the green plant material to have to put into the compost yards. Um, their initial inoculum, they started in the small piles that you see on the lower picture on the left. They started making the inoculum of these organisms to go into their larger windrows that they could be using in some of their production as well. Excuse me. And then here's their turner, um, and you can see the windrows, nice tall piles. You just have to be sticking your hands into it. You gotta be measuring temperature, you wanna be measuring oxygen, you wanna make certain as you're turning that there are no horrific smells happening. Yep, steam on the bottom, no worries about steam. It just means the temperature in your pile is much higher than the outside temperature, and there's a little bit of moisture in the air. So Shane started learning how to make better and better compost, started improving his fungal inoculum, didn't have anaerobic conditions anymore. So they were applying at a rate of 1 to 10 tons per hectare. So you're looking at half a ton per acre. Um, depending on what was missing in the soil. Because as you've got that microscope, you know what's missing in your soil, and so you know how much of your compost to be putting on. Next slide, if you would, please. So I like his turner. That's a nice over-the-row version 
so um, Shane had 25 workers that he trained. Um, he had, you know, brewers, large size brewers, so he could be making enough to apply on all of his acreage um, because he wanted to get that biology turned around and get to the end of the process as rapidly as possible. He put out a fair amount of compost tea. So um, 150,000 liters of compost tea every two days per hectare, I assume. Um, to very rapidly get the leaf coverage. Well, how do you know if you've got the leaf, leaf coverage you need? Microscope, take a look at it. Um, Shane is saying cleaning the brewers was the most challenging part. Well, you know, I it's me and my uh, high pressure washer. Um, I would probably just, you know, put additional hoses, um, you know, uh, bibs on that thing so that when the compost tea is out, you could a uh, um, high pressure wash all of these tanks at the same time and get rid of the any biofilms, any um, material that's uh, not completely washed out of the bottom of the tank. So you could very rapidly. So there are ways to do that um, much more automatically. So you can see his sprayer in the bottom left. Um, and you want to make certain that you've got the mist coming up from the bottom and covering the bottom of the leaves. The leaf material on the bottom is where most of the diseases and the pests are going to establish. You don't see them. Other predators don't see them. And so you've got to make sure that you're covering the bottom of the leaf even more than the top. And then you can see on the bottom right how much improvement in banana production has occurred because the biology has been applied. Next slide. Um, Jane also noticed a huge incre increase in the thickness and density of the root hairs. Lots more small, fine feeder roots starting to happen. Um, at the very bottom, you can see that fungal hyphae. You can see that, those white strands. Um, that's what you want to see. You want to see that really good, thick, rhizomorph material occurring and that's gonna um, let you know that your root systems are finally happy one more once again building structure is another really important thing that you've got to have both the bacteria and the fungi present to build structure so oxygen and water and the root systems of bananas will go deep working with the guys at Coffs Harbor in Australia um, they first believed that the root systems of bananas were just up here on the surface, that they didn't go down into the soil at all. No, that's because they they had a really terrible compaction layer in that soil. It was it was just awful, and so of course the root systems couldn't go down. They were restricted to this you know, little tiny layer of soil at the surface of the of their system. Whereas when we came in and we covered that all with really good compost around those trees, those root systems immediately just boom, went for deep. They don't want to blow over in a hurricane. They don't want to be ripped out and taken away. So, you know, wind is, uh, yeah, kind of a driving force. And we don't want that to be happening. So you've got to get those root systems going down into the soil. I think the last time I talked with Graham um, and his um, farm director, they were noting that the root systems on the bananas were down at 10 feet. So healthy soil when your roots can start going down that deep. Next slide, if you would, please. So um, some pictures then of um, you know their production. So you can see their, the plants in their greenhouse. Let's get the potting mix that you're making. Have the really good biology in it so your plants come to the field with the proper biology around them. You apply that pop, proper biology into the planting hole. You make certain that the mycorrhizal fungi are in your potting mix. So when they, their plants come out to the field, they already have the mycorrhizal fungi on them. And so all of these steps that you want to think about 
ever improving that fungal to bacterial biomass ratios. So banana, it's a glorified grass. So most of the time we're looking at banana as having a fungal to bacterial biomass ratio, somewhere around maybe two to five. That's what we want to achieve. Shane was getting the bacterial ratios going from zero, no fungi at all, in his original dirt that he started working with. And so in this first year, he got that fungal to bacterial ratio to a 0.35, huge improvement, but not yet there where we need it to be. Of course, you got to have the protozoa. You better have some nem good guy nematodes, not the bad guys. So moving things along in the right direction, compost, extracts, teas, microscope, because you got to know the good guys are there and that you're actually improving them in your soils. Next slide. So I love all the pictures in here of Shane's improved production, and it applies not just to his bananas, but to the spinach and the green beans and the ginger. So it's great to have Shane show you the pictures of his ginger as it improved through that growing season. And then think about the fact that this is not just the end. He's not got everything to where it should be. He still has more improvement. Well, as he improves his biology in the soil, he's going to get greater yields, less problems with it. So he's only going to improve his yields and the amount of money that he's making is just going to get better and better and better. Next slide. Ta-da, pretty pictures of bananas. So I don't know. Um, uh, Raleigh, did he tell you what the, those two different um, banana boxes were? Was, was this like his? Well, I think the first one is just example of the healthy bananas coming into the supermarket and the you know bananas at that checkout counter you know they're they're unblemished they're looking great and these are high priced organic bananas you know it's like when you go in a supermarket and you see the quality of bananas it's great he was just saying he was just he was getting a much like a great price because organic bananas are in huge demand they, they're they're not grown a lot and especially south africa is because they're so hard to grow that's why is you know he, he'd been trying this process for years because the demand was so high for organic bananas there in South Africa. Yep. That was just showing like these are such high quality, high quality bananas compared to other ones you would find in the supermarket. So which, uh, which agricultural field do you want? <laughs> no brainer. So isn't that the last slide for me? That's it. I mean, this is a good opportunity. If you want to take a bath, we'll earn bathroom break. Free, please go for it. <laughs> I need to go for two hours. I but, can uh, eat lunch. <laughs> you'll go eat lunch, but this is great. Like, so Brian's coming out really soon. He's coming from a regenerative agriculture homestead background to share his story. But first, I want to tell you more about what Shane said. Like, I, I talk with Shane a lot about it, and it's hard to reach out to him. It's even in the middle of the season. But what he said, he was so interested to share. He really wanted to share it because this saved his farm. You know, this is 1,500 hectares. This is a huge area. And it could have collapsed in a year, but by, by using this practice, he was able to turn this around in a year. While, while being a full-time farmer, while taking these online classes, he was able to use this information and get massive results on his farm. It was mind-blowing and just seeing just how fast things can turn around. And this can apply anywhere, anywhere this can apply. And he said, you know, I like to give God all the glory for what's been achieved on the family farm, which could have not been possible with the help of Dr. Elaine Ingham and the environmental celebration team. So that's some great words to end on by Shane. And now I want to turn it over to an amazing homestead farmer, Brian Vegg, and his journey to becoming a Life in the Soil consultant and helping other farmers do the same thing with improving production on their farms. Let me make oh, sure thanks, up there. Can you guys see me? Hear me? Yeah. Can everybody see and hear Brian fine? Yep. Everybody can see you. Okay, Brian. Thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate your time, man. Sure. So um, thank you for letting me share my story. So I am Brian Vag, and um, I'm a homesteader. 
at least it's kind of how I started my journey. And I just want to share a little bit about my story and how I got where I'm at. Um, so start off, I did grow up on a homestead when I was a child. My parents raised animals. We grew orchard crops. We had vegetables. They were very much into let's grow the food that we're going to to eat and sustain ourselves. And um, with that, my parents were very conventional. Um, you know, they they used fertilizers and herbicides and pesticides and fungicides. You know, for every symptom, there was a, a side to be able to use to be able to try to solve it. And, you know, it was a lot of work. I, I remember uh, as a kid, one of the things I actually hated about the homestead was the amount of weeds. Oh, my gosh. I pulled weeds constantly when I was a kid. Um, and it was one of the, the things that kind of turned me off about homestead in, in one sense. Um, but years later, um, my wife and I get married and we're talking about, you know, where we want to live. And it just seemed like a natural fit. Wanted to go back to the homestead lifestyle. So... 14 years ago, my wife and I bought a five acre plot of land in Northern California and we started to build our homestead and, you know, you kind of use what you know, right? So I started down the whole conventional path of getting fertilizer and putting this side for whatever symptom or problem. And I just was not happy with the results. It seemed year after year, it just degraded and it was more work and the quality of the food was less and less and less. And so I, you know, we just needed to figure out a better way. And so we started looking at, you know, reading about uh, permaculture and, and other, you know, methodologies. And I feel like I have kind of a kindred spirit with Matt or at least a similar story, which is, you know, I came across the idea of permaculture design science and some of the other, you know, talk about soil biology, and I started to apply uh, those practices. And in some cases, got great results. In other cases, didn't get good results or got the opposite of. And what was really lacking, and I'm the type of person that, that has to know the the why is something happening and how is the mechanisms uh, that are, are causing these things to to come about, and. I couldn't find it. It was um, missing to me, and it was a major sense of frustration. And I came across a, a video that Dr. Ingham had put. Uh, it was a video of her doing a talk, and um, it just seemed to make so much sense when she was going through and talked about the high, the hows, and the whys. And and I, it, it just something snapped inside of me. I said, "This is definitely something I can relate to." And um, and that's we, I went ahead and took the classes and. Um, and with that, um, decided to actually transform my life as well from not just a, a point of getting the knowledge and applying it to my homestead, but wanting to change careers and actually go into helping other people, uh, either individuals or farmers, uh, you know, convert or transform from conventional styles of farming or growing to the biological uh, means and methods. And uh, it's, it's been a fantastic journey so far. Uh, next slide. So this is our homestead, and when we first built our homestead, you know, we went the whole conventional route. We had a front yard and a backyard, and we put a lawn, and on the left-hand side is a picture of our lawn, and it was really all the topsoil was scraped off of the bulldozer. It was down to pretty much bedrock and a little bit of soil, uh, but, but you know, the, the maintaining that lawn was always just a source of irritation to me because it required so much fertilizer and it had so many uh, different diseases and pests and so forth. And when we went down the permaculture route, we were like, okay, let's let's change that that lawn into a food forest. And so we went through the process of, you know, adding mulching and organic material and planting the plants, and then taking the information that we learned from Elaine's uh, courses um, and creating compost and compost tea. And you know, this is a four-year evolution in in this uh, backyard or food forest, and we went from pretty much dirt really awful, awful dirt to just a thriving ecosystem with fruit trees and berry plants and herbs and some annual vegetables and flowers. And I mean, we're, we're a little bit over 50 species of plants in just that very small area. But once we, we got the soil biology right uh, and we're able to really make plants thrive, all of our pest problems went away. It was um, just a, an amazing transformation. And, and it's one of those proof positive things in your mind, you know, when you, you can see the results and you know why it's working, it just really affirms, okay, I'm, I'm going down the right path. All right, next slide. 
So with that, um, you know, one of the things that I think I, I've, I've walked away at this point um, is that I, I'm confident that I can transform my soil and my plants because I, I see it. I see it in both the, the nutrient value uh, of my plants. I see it in the production, the growth, the vigor, the re reduction of pests and so forth. Uh, but I'm also confident now that I have the the tools and the knowledge uh, to be able to help other people transform their soil, you know, from dirt to soil and make their plants thrive and grow. And, you know, ultimately for me, this it is transformed my life. I mean, it really has. Um, it's opened up new avenues of thought as well as also new opportunities uh, for me to be able to provide an existence. So it, it's just been absolutely a fantastic um, a, a journey going through this. Okay, so that's my story. Um, so I'd like to talk about the classes. So next slide. Okay, so uh, Dr. Ingham has put together a really fantastic series of classes. Um, I can't tell you how much I've appreciated the learning the hows and the whys. Um, and the way that the classes are structured, it's, it's one to give you the foundational knowledge, you know, to, to help you understand why does, you know, nutrient cycling work the way it does? What is the soil food web? Um, to the practical applications of, of actually making compost and creating compost teas and then using a microscope to be able to tell, you know, as a very analytic tool, just say, am I going the right direction or am I not going the right direction? Um, and, you know, going through Shane's uh, story beforehand, you can see, you know, that practical application, once you start to get it right, it really does make a, a huge difference. Okay, so let's talk about the classes themselves. Next slide. So the first class um, that I recommend for everybody to take is the Life in the Soils class. This is really the, the foundation of understanding. This is going to help ground you into understanding what is the you know, soil food web. Uh, what is the difference between dirt and soil? It's something that, that uh, you, know, you need to understand. Uh, how does nutrient cycling work? You know, why is it important to have the different types of uh, bacteria or diversity of bacteria and fungi and then the protozoa and the nematodes and microarthropods, you know, what is their role in this whole nutrient cycling uh, paradigm? And then what's the interaction between the plants and the soil biology? It's a very important understanding to, to gain. And getting that foundational knowledge then helps you get to the practical. So the Life in the Soil class, um, especially for this webinar, um, I know there's a special going on. Typically, it's 1997, uh, but for this, uh, for the folks in the webinar, you have a limited amount of time to sign up, but it's $997, huge savings. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so then we get into the practical application aspects of the classes. So there's the, the composting class. You know, one, it's, it's good to understand what is good compost, what makes up good compost, but how do you do it? Um, you know, there's different composting methodologies. There's thermophilic composting, there's static piles, there's vermicomposting. When should you use one or the other? And if you do choose to use one of those, what is the process to actually make good compost? Uh, then there's the compost tea. So you made this fantastic compost, but now you want to refine it even more. You want to be able to you know, really boost up the biology before you, you place it out into your fields, or you want to, you know, really push the fungal, the uh, bacterial biomass ratio. So you're going to use certain food sources to be able to generate, you know, fantastic compost tea that kind of meets the, the, the needs that you're, you're trying to apply. And so there's the whole process of what does brewing actually do um, and how to do it? And what kind of food resources you know, should you add? How much compost should you add? Why is it important to clean your brewer and all those other uh, good aspects about maintaining your brewing environment? And then uh, the lastly is the, the microscope class. And so this really is one, if you, if you never use a microscope in your life, um, that's okay. You, you know, Elaine goes through and, and talks about the, what is a microscope? Why do you have to have a certain type of microscope? with the different parts of a microscope, but then getting into once you start using the microscope, what is the biology that you're looking at? <laughs> is it good biology or is it bad biology? Are the conditions aerobic or the anaerobic? And so <clears throat> these classes, again, for the webinar, uh, typically as a, a total, they're $3,000. <clears throat> Sorry, let me take a real sip here real quick. <clears throat> I feel like I just had my Marco Rubio moment. <clears throat> Okay, and so um, you have $3,000 typically for the class, uh, for all three of these classes, $1,000 a piece, but for uh, the, the seminar here, it's uh, $500 individually and or $1,500 as a bundle. And if you can go to the next slide, 
there is the bundle of classes, which is what I took, um, you know, the life and the soils, the composting class, the compost tea class, and the microscope class. Uh, typically, they run, you know, $5,000 for all of those classes. Uh, but again, with the webinar, it's twenty four ninety seven. So uh, fantastic deal. Like I said, these are classes that are transformational, transforming not only the soil and your plants, but in my case, it transformed my life. So uh, next slide, please. And with this is a money back a guarantee. So, um, you know, if you're unsatisfied with the classes, then you can reach out to Dr. Ingham and, and uh, the Environmental Salvation Institute and talk about that. But you know what? I tell you what, when you start going through these classes and you recognize the amount of content and the knowledge that you can gain from it, it is worth every single penny that I spent for it for sure. Next slide, please. And so in order to take advantage of the specials for the, um, you know, as part of this webinar, uh, there's a discount code. It's RW April and expires May 1st. So you have a few days to, to be able to get that in. But I would, like I said, highly, highly suggest uh, for those of you that really want to learn this, this is um, a fantastic set of classes to be able to get there. And with the classes, um, you know, one is to get knowledge. You know, some of you might just stop with the classes, gain your, your foundational knowledge, learn how to apply it, and that's great. Uh, and some of you may decide to become soil life consultants and take the knowledge even to a step further and learn how to be able to apply this not to your own environment, but also to help others. So, uh, Raleigh, I think I am done. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Brian. That was awesome. Thanks for sharing your story about your homestead and and going through the classes because that's so many people want to get on us because they see the potential of it. I, I've, you know, I, I took the classes too. I'm, I'm on the microscope part, but man, it was just the first time I saw them doing compost tea. It was just so mind blowing. Cause I, I just thought this is, this is such a simple process, you know, get that, get those ratios right in the compost. Then you can brew them in the compost tea. Then you can apply them on the garden. It's so awesome because, you know, in my little backyard garden, I have to go out and buy bags of bags of compost when I'm still building it. Well, I'm like, I can build one pile and do that whole area and make a compost tea, and then it just it's just scaling. And, this, and the it results shows, like, you, are It's so yeah. scalable. And and you're saying it's like a force multiplier on your homestead where, you know, compost tea mixed with all these awesome uh, plant guilds and compost at, you know, what, a rate, age ratio of like a ton to acre. That's not a lot in like a – backyard or five acres you know it's manageable easily yep. yeah okay folks well now we're on the q and a session so oh let me uh <laughs> let me get elaine back on here i think i she was chewing on a granola bar so i kind of muted her for a second <laughs> but elaine's back yeah. on. just click your webcam uh, button and you should pop back up okay i'm gonna do that in a minute the person who there was another person who had this room space um, oh, okay. for three o'clock, and I didn't think we were going to go that long. And guess what we did? So okay. I've got to move out someplace else, hopefully where I'm not going to bother anybody else during the next half hour, 45 minutes, where we do some Q&A. Okay, awesome. Well, you know, if there's some basic questions that Neil and I can get to before yeah. Lane can join on, so they ask away. Like, because uh, I've I've gone through to the microscope class, and Neil's Neil's been in this too. But yeah, Phil, we got this is great. We got 400 people on the line while while uh, Elaine is moving, when she's relocating, we can get to some of these. Um, Garden containers. <laughs> I love this behind the scenes. I mean, you, by the way, if it's loud from my, I've got some background noise where I am. So if okay. you're, let me know and I can mute myself when I'm not talking. Okay. Yeah. Here's here's one from uh, Siska. I guess is asking if I take all the courses from Malin for the soil classes, how long would it take to get through all of them? You know, honestly, you know, like the life and souls class, that's that's like 16 lessons that are an hour long. Uh, you know, being safe, you could get through. I, I'd say it took me about two months, but some people can go through them like that. You know, if, if you get this information, if you are been studying this for a few years, you know, you could take, uh, you know, a class a month or less. So, you know, they generally it's, it took me about four to five months to go through most of them. Um, 
but yeah, you can you can move through them really quick. Like I was I was jumping through life in the soil and compost pretty pretty fast. But yeah, it yeah. it just depends on how much time you you want to dedicate to it. But I think yeah. you could, the quickest you could do would probably be a couple weeks, and more likely like six to eight if you're taking it easy. Yeah, and I mean, but that's like Shane was saying that in between running a fifteen hundred hectare farm, he was doing these class, you know, classes at night, you know, just zipping through them like one or two, like two or three a week until he got them, and implementing that within the course of a year. So even if you're in this crazy hectic schedule, you can find the time for it. Even though that's that's a hard thing to say, and so people are like, I'm so damn busy, I can't find the time to do anything. <laughs> It's about how you can use it. Here, here's a question from Anthony. What's Neil doing overseas? Ooh, I'm sure that's a whole. We've got a whole series on what Neil's doing overseas. Yeah, it's um, yeah. the terraforming series. Yeah, I don't think we should talk about what I'm doing overseas today. Yeah, definitely. Um, Elaine, you, can you hear? And I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, great. You have this good angle. You're looking down. <laughs> no. Yeah. We're all like toddlers looking up and hearing, hearing Elaine's questions. This is great. You know, we got, you know, 350 people right now with a lot of questions. So we'll try to get to them as many as we can, but okay. um, we not, might not be able to get to them all. So thanks for the folks who asked questions earlier and saved until now. Okay. So this is from Katie. And this, I know a lot of, a lot of people ask this uh, about manure, uh, but basically about manure, she's asking, can you make good compost using manure from cows that are getting dewormers and other medications from a commercial dairy, for instance? So, yeah, you will want to avoid the manure that has dewormer. So uh, for about a week after an animal has been giving, I have a slow connection. No. Um, so for... So for about a week um, after a um, animal has been given a dewormer, you want to avoid their manure, or you're going to have to let that manure age um, with uh, some an inocula of um, really good organisms before you would use it. And that means it's no longer high nitrogen. So avoid any manure that has dewormer medicine that they've given the animal. All right, fair enough answer. Okay, uh, so this is from Miko. He's asking, what do you think about EM, effective microbes products? How useful are they? Oh, I think you may have had that audio issue. I, her, she's got, I think, Bluetooth headphones, and sometimes they, they like, automatically sync. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you might have to do the, the plug-out, plug-in thing or whatever you did before. Uh, so here's from Peen, Peen von Schack, he's asking, can you do the compost tea microscope classes if you don't have access to land? Like, I, I've got, I believe I've got a backyard, and I've been doing that, and, I mean, sometimes that's that's a benefit, like, you know, you could have a park, and, you know, you could, on such a small scale, you don't have, it's like, the ability to make mistakes is more lenient, so if you're going out this and buying a five, you know, thousands of dollars of uh, a compost turner, you probably want to do that on the smaller scale first. So it, having a large land access is not a requirement for it. Elaine, how, okay, so her audio is still there. Okay. Oh, man, this will be a fun question. She'll she'll pop in. If, if not, I can switch to her computer microphone. Oh, I really want to get to this one. Will, Willard's going to ask, how would you implement these practices to promote soil health on a large scale? 50,000 acres plus rangeland used for cattle grazing. Is I it possible? I have thoughts about that one. What's that? Elaine, are you back on? Try try speaking. Well, not yet. All right. Uh, let me try. Let me, oh, is that her? Nope. She'll come on I had, eventually. I had some thoughts about this large grazing operation, though, because I think generally the uh, 
you're, the the method of dispersal you're going to have for any sort of increasing soil biology where you're grazing is likely going to be the cows themselves. Um, especially at that sort of scale, um, you know, you've already got the animals doing so much of that function for you. They're digesting all the grass. They've got the bacteria-rich environment in their stomach. Um, and then they're, the grasslands have evolved with those cattle or rather with something like those cattle. And so it's, I think we've seen lots of examples, not necessarily with Elaine and compost teas where um, properly managed cattle have improved soils a great deal just because of the increasing health of the grassland. So I don't know, would you want to, uh, over that much space, it would require harvesting so much material it, it would be a big operation for sure disposal, it, it's just going to be costly on that sort of size especially when you already have you know a biological organism doing so much of that work for you one thing that we do have uh you know we just made a 20 minute little mini documentary about an example in australia you know these are several thousand hectare uh, dairy farms in Australia, and what you saw that by the end of when when they showed a few examples on those as few hectares of dairy farms, or as a few thousand hectares, a hundred and I think it was ended up being two hundred and seventy five more dairy farmers signed up to do this this compost biological restoration as well. So that just shows you it's like and that's why Camperdown Compost is. She was saying they're so busy because there's so much land acreage. That they can do these processes on because you know if you can graze your animals once a season versus 10 times a season with biology that's going to be hugely hugely impactful even though gosh that's 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 quite a challenge challenge of scale 50,000 acres but you know i think elaine has shown that that kind of scale is possible let me let me type uh i'll post that video in the chat box so when you have time you can watch that so there you go. It's in the chat box. In our Facebook page that we've got. Yeah. Uh, all right. I'm going to take the questions that I can take, and we're going to get Elaine back in here. Yeah. Yeah, Elaine. Um, so we had that one from Jay in New Mexico. Here's Jay's question. I don't know if everyone else can read it, where he says um, he's got someone using high nitrate water to grow wheat in New Mexico, and what are the consequences for that? Um, and it's, I typed in that it's going to depend on the mode of irrigation, but, um, as well as that water management. But when you've got water with, that's highly saline that's sitting on top of your land through, whether you're doing center pivot irrigation or flood irrigation or even drip, over time you're going to increase the salinity of that land. Um, and, I mean, it may be that this guy in 10 years won't be able to grow wheat anymore. He'll have to do barley or something because the wheat can't take the salt. And this is exactly what happened. This has happened in lots of places. But the most famous example is with the Mesopotamians who, you know, invented irrigation and they would flood irrigate their wheat fields. And uh, over a couple hundred years in their case, because they were using pure water, um, they destroyed that land's ability to produce anything. Uh, and that's why most of Iraq is now a desert, you know, thousands of years later, was the Mesopotamians destroyed that land's capacity to farm. Yeah. Here's a, actually, hey, Brian, can you hop on? I think a few of these you might be able to answer because you're, you're in life in the soil as a consultant. I think a lot of these are directed at, at homes, homestead. Well, not homestead, but, you know, sure. smaller, medium scale. Here's one from Liz. She's asking, what if an animal has been eating high pesticide GMO alfalfa or composting non-organic straw? I've seen people's gardens get destroyed by non-organic straw. Does proper composting counteract the pesticides? A proper composting will help um, chelate or isolate out some of those uh, compounds. You can have the bacteria start to break them down, and then the, uh, the fungus uh, help to finish. You know, in my homestead, I typically tried to avoid uh, non-organic meth, you know, 
composting materials like straws or haze and that type of thing. But I've also gotten sources that I, I did not know. I, I have to you know question if uh, they would be uh, organic or not. Um, you know, so the preference would be yes. Try to find stuff that is not um, you know has the pesticides or manures from where cows have been eating, you know, uh, material that has full of pesticides. Um, but if that's your only option, um, then it just, you may not get as high quality compost to start with, um, but at least you can start to make compost. Uh, if it's, you know, it's a spot where it's just laden with, with you know, pesticides and fungicides and so forth, um, you know, one way to do it is, is to take the material, build a compost pile, get your microscope out and then see the results. If you know you manage the, the temperature, you know you manage the moisture correctly, uh, but the, the quality of your compost is just very subpar or seems to be like the biology is not taking, then you probably have a problem with the inputs that you're using. So the, the best way I think to answer that question is, um, if that's the only access you have, the only material that you can use, or it's such a cheap material that, that you wanna try to use it, build a compost pile, Get out your microscope and take a look, and, and see if if you really are able to to you know create the compost that you desire. Nice, awesome. Okay, uh, so I'm Brian. I hope you're cool. Like, there's we might direct a lot more questions at you if that's all right. Fire away. Okay. Fire awesome. away. Uh, so there'll be a few questions about a lot of people have small scale stuff, uh, small gardens, and and they want to do this on a smaller ha farm. Uh, real quick, before I go and hop in a lane, there's, I guess Comcast exploded their internet over there. So I'm going to try to hack some crazy way of her to get back in through hotspots. Sure. Uh, but for those of you who are, who are curious about, you know, replays and handouts and the classes, it's all below in the chat box and the handouts. Like you can download the presentation. There's a PDF file. You can find the offer. It's a Word file. And, uh, and the discount code and the link is in the chat box below. So all of those things are below. And also, uh, pay attention to inboxes. You're going to get the replay email sent to you right after this as soon as it's downloaded. Hopefully tonight, maybe tomorrow morning, along with the names of the winners of the giveaway. Because one of you guys <laughs> has won a compost class, which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tease you all. I'm going to tease you. And wait. Wait to announce it over email. So that'll be fun. But here we go. Brian's going to answer some awesome questions about compost. Yeah, once you start the one, just, uh, you know, look through the questions and just pick the, the ones that sure. you want to answer. Yeah, Maybe. so there's one by Rosalyn. Uh, she says, uh, I have a series. Oh, let me, it's uh, scrolling for me, so let me get it up here. Um, Rosalyn asks, I, I have had a series of unsuccessful thermophilic composts due to them being overrun with mold, umocytes, fungi, which might, uh, why might this be happening? How can we encourage the beneficial fungi while discouraging the harmful fungi? All right, so uh, typically the harmful fungi, the pathogens, the umocytes, are going to exist in anaerobic conditions. So the key thing here is make your pile aerobic. So, all right, what does that mean and how do I get there? So when you're doing a thermophilic pile, uh, I guess a good thing to think about thermophilic pile is you're managing multiple things. You're managing temperature and you're managing moisture over a period of time, right? So um, we use a, a series of tools like a, a composting thermometer to be able to tell what the temperature is. And we also use, um, you know, I use my hands to be able to determine the level of moisture. You can actually get a hydrometer and, and, and get more specific. Um, but we kind of have a methodology that we use where after a period of time that a pile has been at a certain temperature, uh, we'll want to turn that pile. And we'll want to make sure that the, the temperature doesn't get so high that, which means the biology is really, really you know, exploding and consuming all the oxygen and then turning anaerobic. So we're, we're monitoring the temperature of our pile over a specific period of time. And then when the pile has gone through that phase of temperature over the time frame, we're going to turn it and make sure that we add air back into the pile. And you'll find when you're doing a compost pile that the um, the temperature is really hot in the center of the pile and cooler around the edge of the pile. So we want to make sure that all the material actually gets into that hot center. 
So we have a very specific way that we actually turn compost piles so that we can ensure that all parts of the compost pile have gone into um, that hot center. All right, so if you think you got your temperature right um, over the period of time, the next thing is to make sure you check your moisture. Um, and so, you know, we're shooting for about 50% moisture inside those piles. Um, and if your moisture is too high, you know, you get above 50%, um, then you might be going anaerobic because there's not enough oxygen being able to get into the pile. If you get your temperature too low, I mean, sorry, your moisture too low, uh, then you don't have enough moisture to actually drive the biology and the biology will go dormant. And typically that means your, your uh, temperatures are going to fall off. So now we added the, the moisture part of it into the equation. If we got that right and the temperature and the time, then the next thing I would look at is what are the materials that you're using? So when you build a thermophilic compost pile, you're going to be looking for um, um, you know, a certain amount of high nitrogen to a certain amount of green material to a certain amount of what we call brown or woody material. <clears throat> and once you've got your ratios correct, then you're going to want to be able to mix them very well. So you don't have spots of the pile that have a whole bunch of high nitrogen and other spots that have just fully wooded, um, you know, uh, material. If you don't have it mixed well, then you're going to get hot spots and anaerobic conditions, and you can actually breed a lot of those, um, you know, umicytes or, or uh, disease-causing fungi or pathogens. So uh, part of this is just really learning what is the appropriate way to actually run a thermophilic pile. So a lot of considerations that you have to, to you know, think through, but once you get the methodologies down and you get your recipes down, um, then it becomes pretty easy, um, you know. Now making thermophilic compost piles is just kind of second nature. You get a kind of an instinctual um, feel for it. Okay, so Rosalind, I hope I answered your question. Okay. All right. So uh, let me see. What's another a lane update? Yeah. The the people that co-work in the space they were lame. They they kicked her out. And well, not kicked her out, oh, but they said the internet was disabled. So she's driving home right now. She'll be back in in about fifteen minutes. But luckily, we got a lot of questions we can answer. And then Elaine will be back on, but yeah, I think Brian, I, I, there's a there's a ton of questions. Questions in there, sure, sure. Um, let me just grab another one, and if if uh, either you or Neil can also help, maybe you know, oh yeah, parse some questions out while I'm speaking, sure. that would help out too. Here you I go. Know, about, I, this this yeah, one go from Aman Emanuela. Uh, she's asking, I have a small garden, about 100 square meters. I built raised beds and I'm looking to establish a food forest type of polyculture with guild planting, herbs, etc. I'm mulching. Uh, this is a long question. Yeah. <laughs> I'm reading okay. it right now. Uh, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, you got to, uh, you got to phrase it as a, as a question. If it's like a long paragraph or uh, that we can't, we can't really answer it. So you need to phrase your statement as a question. So there we go. So Anthony's asking, would worms help with that compost issue Brian is speaking on? Um, so worms, you know, I'll find in a lot of my you know, thermophilic piles, when it's in the process of being thermophilic, no, your, your worms are going to avoid that pile because, you know, the temperatures get up to 160, 165 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, most worms are just really going to try to, 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 to leave. Um, but I'll find some of my piles that when I actually uh, get to the maturing part of it, then some worms will come back in. Either there were eggs that were already in there that still made it through the, the thermophilic process and then they were able to to you know explode into the uh, pile, great. If I see worms in my, my thermophilic piles as they matured, no problems at all. But then there's also vermicomposting, which is actually using worms to actually do the composting process. And it's different from thermophilic. Um, in thermophilic, you know, there are some advantages as far as being able to knock out uh, disease-causing pathogens. So that, that temperature that we're running at, you know, 160 degrees Fahrenheit, a lot of the cases will actually destroy some of the, the, the bad pathogens. Um, and in some of your static piles of vermicompost, you don't necessarily are going to get rid of all those. Um, and also, if you had a lot of seeds in your um, uh, vermicomposting, you may not get rid of all those. So you may have some seed contaminations there. But with with vermicomposting, though, I think worms are a fantastic source. They, they in their guts, they will uh, foster both fungi and bacterial, and you usually get a pretty good uh, fungal to bacterial 
or biomass ratio. So um, if you get worms in your compost pile when it's done, not a problem. If you have vermin composting, you're really using worms to do composting, I think that's fantastic as well. Okay, great. He's kind of a follow-up. It's uh, how much time does it take to make good compost? So I would say that um, it, it's about, I don't know, a six to eight week process to go through the thermophilic um, from when it's, when you first start, it's going to go very, very hot. You're going to turn it a number of times and then it will eventually uh, slowly come back down to ambient temperature. And that's about that six to eight week period of time. But the compost of that space, that point is not in, you know, really finished. It's usable. You're going to find a lot of good biology and you'll find some good fungal sources, but you know, typically I'll put my compost to bed and, uh, it, and mature it. And so there's, there's a care to the finished product. If you just put your, your finished compost out in the pile and let it dry out, well, then all your biology is going to go dormant. So you have to really monitor and maintain your finished compost. But I find, and you know, Dr. Ingham also expresses this as well, that um, six months is when you're kind of at the peak. So six months from start of making the compost pile to the, you know, of the, um, you know, six months later, that thermophilic pile tends to have the best um, diversity of biology counts and so forth. But I have also used some of my compost, you know, that's been a year old um, and still has given me fantastic results. It's not as good as it was when it was six months, but it's still usable at, at the year. Cool. Here's, here's another question, kind of the follow-up to that from Jay Valencia. He's asking, can I turn a piece of sandy New Mexican soil possibly into a veggie farm, a quarter acre to an acre? You sure can. Yes. In fact, um, uh, Elaine has a couple of good examples in the uh, in the, the course where, you know, they were in Florida, I think, and they were putting a golf course in on pretty much sand. There was not much else but sand in that soil. And you'll find that um, if you can add some organic matter when you're planting in your plants and then you're adding your compost, well, compost itself will add organic matter and you add your compost teas that the plants themselves, as they're going through the process, they're putting out organic matter into that soil. And so they they really, in, in, in some sense, are transforming or terraforming the environment that they're in to make it suitable for them to be able to grow. But the key to that, though, in order to allow the plants to be able to do that is to make sure that you have the right biology. So you have fungal and bacteria and all the different protozoan nematodes and so forth. Um, so, yes, you can plant in sandy soil. You can plant in uh, heavy clay soils. You can plant in very silty soils. Um, it, it just you, you may have some different management practices when you first put it in versus those in different environments, uh, but it is extremely possible. And in fact, um, it's very practical to use the soil biology methodologies to, to plant in those environments that seem to be a little bit more in the extreme uh, side of the soil types. Cool. Here's one from Gord asking, any merit in spreading compost on a row crop before it is fully mature? And let it finish while on the soil um, before it has gone through that thermal phase. Uh, you broke up real quick. Can you say it one more time? Uh, okay. Is that any merit in spreading compost on a row crop before it's fully mature and let it finish on the soil? Um, I mean, you'll get some benefit. You'll have some biology that's there and organic matter that will break down. Um, I'm not necessarily convinced that you'll have the full benefit of having a matured set of compost. So if it's still in the thermophilic phase, I don't think I would put that out on my plants. Um, you know, it's in it, especially if, you, if it's in the thermophilic process and you spread it out, you're going to really um, – take away its ability to to run the biology at that high temperatures or the, the, the quantities of biology. So I, I would wait until you at least had gotten your compost down to ambient temperature before you applied it. But it, as long as it's gone down to ambient temperature and you apply it, it's still not in that six-month period of time. Uh, yes, you'll still find benefit as long as it's good compost. Cool. So here's one from Igor. Can one inoculate the bad compost? With right with right microbes to make it better. So yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I I tend to, and I think Elaine actually talks about this in the classes as well. You could take compost that's maybe gone anaerobic or that putrefied organic material and so forth, but recompost it. Don't necessarily apply it out there and just put a knock on there. Uh, take that 
compost, add it as a woody material into your compost pile and have it go through the thermophilic process. Again, you want to kill out the pathogens. You want to be able to ch change it from an anaerobic condition to an aerobic condition. Uh, at that point, then uh, then you should be good to go. Now, there may be, you know, if it's some chemical contamination of why it was that way, because some compost, they actually add dyes. They'll add all kinds of crazy stuff to it. Uh, but, you know, Try it, run through a thermophilic process, and, and if you're able to, to get the compost to work and you can look under a microscope and see that it actually has created the biology you desire, then, yeah, you're, you should be good to go. Awesome. Yeah, that and was, Neil, that was really... Go ahead. Oh, I thought Neil was trying to, to say something. Maybe he wasn't. I had a thought about that New Mexico question. Mm -hmm. um, mostly because I tend to be against irrigation whenever possible. <laughs> but um, we had we had a really good webinar with a mesquite farmer who was he was in New Mexico, right, Raleigh? Yeah, rest in peace, uh, Mark Mark Moody. Yeah, Mark Moody was uh, he was farming mesquite trees and had the ability to plant stuff in between them, but didn't choose to because of his water situation. But um, he was making good money off of that farm. And it was all tree crops. It was a lot. And he was doing that work as a guy with some, uh, with some handicaps. But um, that, may be one, that may be one for you to look at, Jay. We've got it in our archive. Uh, just food for thought. It, it, it'd be worth looking at. Awesome. Sure. And I think, you know, uh, an advantage of going, you know, with the soil biology route in those really sandy soils, the sandy soils, a lot of times they drain really fast. They don't retain moisture very well. And once you start to change and add that organic matter into the soil, um, then your water retention goes up by a lot. Uh, in fact, you know, you can get 50 percent, 75 percent better water retention just by having a lot more organic matter in the soil and creating those. You're building soil structures. You just have sand in there, but you start to build those aggregates that Elaine was talking about earlier, which was, you know, you have the the, bio, the bacteria starts to make those micro aggregates. The fungi goes in there and makes them the, the macro aggregates. Those aggregates themselves become very good sources to be able to hold and retain water. It's crucial stuff. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The tricky thing with a place like that is having the organic matter in the first place. Um, yeah. It's, uh, that's been a perennial issue for me, is that we had no organic matter to start off with, and we either had to truck it in from up the mountains where it's greener, or we are just growing it ourselves, and then we have a certain amount of dead wood and plant stuff that we had to get going initially. Um, that that we can then further process. Yeah, and hopefully it's a snowball after a while, because then once you are able to start growing more organic matter, you can start adding that back into the soil and start, you know, letting it build on top of itself. Tough to do from start though. Yep. Yeah. You know, I think this is a question. I mean, both of you guys can answer it, but uh, Marianne's saying thanks for this enlightening webinar. I uh, wonder what your thoughts are on how to get farmers to adopt regenerative. Uh, SOC capturing, let's say, soil organic carbon capturing practices, large scale. Yeah, you know, I think there was a couple of questions that were um, in that that same thread, and um, you know, I think that some of the challenges that we find in the biological methodology is just getting the information out there. You know, most of the the informational sources that farmers typically tend to go to, either through their county extensions or through the universities and so forth are really beholden to the chemical and agricultural industrial complex, right? And um, so a lot of the information that the farmers are getting is is in that, that realm. Um, but I think as some of these farmers are really getting to the, you know, like Shane, getting pushed to the edge of saying, yeah. uh, you know, how can I – I'm going to lose my farm unless I do something different. And those are the, the farmers that, that tend to convert, I think, easier, where they're like, oh, okay. And then they see the results and then off and running. And I think more of those farmers, I think it's going to be a snowball in that sense as well. More farmers will start paying attention to other farmers that are having successes and recognize there is a different route, a different way to be able to do this. Um, and I, I think also we've got to do a lot of work in with getting the 
universities, the county extensions, the governmental organizations to recognize and understand the, the value and the benefit of this type of work. And it's starting to happen, but I'd say there's, there's resistance for sure. Yeah, and it's like, get, a lot of people I don't know about these. The crisis, what brings it about. Sorry, Raleigh, keep going. Oh, no worries. I mean, you know, you, you don't know about these examples like gi like giant. This is a giant banana farm that you would only assume is, you know, couldn't possibly sustain its sustain itself. You know, it's, it's a monoculture, but yet by using that soil biology, right, he's able to really keep up, like get far beyond the, the chemical agriculture guys by doing this, which is just so mind blowing and it just needs to be recognized. But I think there's a lot more questions here. Sure. But I, you know, I think it is uh, something like the webinars that you guys are hosting here. Uh, this is a way to, for people to be able to get information and start to understand. So, you know, the more of this that happens, the more that people share with other folks, you know, they say, hey, I just took this webinar. You should check this out. Uh, the more that, um, you know, people will become educated on, on this topic. Awesome. Well, yeah, glad, glad you like him and checking him out so far. Uh, is there a quick heads up, too, for folks here? Uh, Elaine, she's driving back right now to get back to her house to set up again. But there will be another Q&A with Elaine on Monday. So, like, the, the course offer goes till Monday night. And then she's going to be back again on Monday, I think, afternoon, same time, to answer some questions. So if you feel like, oh, man, I didn't get my questions answered, uh, that'll be another opportunity to come back get your questions answered then we'll send you the link in in the replay email and you'll just write your questions ahead of time that'll be make sure it's easier to answer so here's i wonder, I wonder if we because we're coming up on 150 minutes now we're at two and a half hours yeah um it might be worthwhile to delay until monday um well like Here's the thing. I, I can keep going. It's like, Neil, if, if you want to roll, but we still, you know, people will, people can exit out if they want to right now. I think we Elaine still have 250 can, people on. Yeah. Yeah. If, if we want to wait till Ling gets back on, that's, that's totally cool. I'm, I'm fine with it. And thank you folks for sticking around uh, for, you know, is it more than, is it about three hours now? No, it's, it's two and a half hours, but still you guys are taking the time out of your day to learn these processes which can really expand so many people's lives, so many practices. So, so thank you. Thank you for taking your time to learn about this, for you're interested in this. Because, you know, we're, we're all so squeezed for time, but if you can find that time to invest in something that has so much payoff in the soil, you know, there's so much dividends. So thanks again for joining. I, I'm, I'm grateful to be here with you all. I mean, 500 people showing up to a webinar about soil science. It's mind-blowing. Compared to what you you know we're normally doing with our time, this I'm always just blown away. Pretty long Good tail stuff, stuff eh? Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, so here's one from Katie. Brian, I think this is another one you could take. It's it seems to be sure. the laying examples. Monocultures are not an issue with plant health. Would you rather? Would you get a greater result again with multi species or with use of compost? Does that compensate for the lack of plant diversity? So a lot of people are asking about. You know, how, like, does this process help with plant diversity or do you need to make different compost for if you're using like an agroforestry system? There's, there's a few folks asking about that. So I, I, I'll give uh, some opinion and um, I'd be very curious to see how Elaine potentially would answer this question as well. But, um, you know, I, I definitely believe that, you know, diverse ecosystems and this is some, you know, my, you know, thoughts or knowledge on the permaculture side of the house is you can definitely get better plant vigor growth and so forth in those diverse environments where you're using a lot of edge. Um, now, the question is, why don't we create food? Like I created a food forest in my backyard. You know, it is by far the most productive piece of land that I have in my, my homestead. Um, and I think it's due to the diversity that's there. The, the plants really do um, help 
you know, foster a, a soil biology environment that's very diverse and uh, very accessible to all the plants that are there. But why don't we do that on a massive scale? And I think there's a lot of permaculturalists that are trying to figure that out. How do we make a design science that incorporates those techniques? Unfortunately, for a lot of farmers right now, there's still the mechanized type of infrastructure that they're using. And the way that they build their markets to be able to sell their products and so forth are kind of in that monoculture space. So um, can we do much better with a biological means than conventional in a monoculture environment? Yes. I mean, I think that the, the proof is there. Um, we're having a lot of farmers that have that kind of success. Could we get more you know, production out of an acre of land if we went really diverse, um, you know, had a whole bunch of different types of, of plants and not a monoculture type of uh, scenario, I would think, yes, you could. Uh, but you would need to change your management practices and you would have to change, you know, how you would actually be able to do your harvesting and so forth. And I think there's a lot of permacultures that are trying to, to figure that out today. Um, so not, I guess maybe not quite a, a yes, no answer, but um, but I think that's, why that a lot of farmers still are in that monoculture space and, and why the, the soil biology still does help. It helps a tremendous amount. Cool. So I'm a lot of people ask. That as well, if that's okay. Yeah, please. Um, the, first of all, the most productive land, the most productive agricultural land is small scale human managed stuff like Brian's homestead. It's much more productive per acre than any large farm that you'll find. Um, but the reason that that's possible is because of the intense human management that happens there. And so the, the scale that you're looking at is a huge issue. Compared with the, uh, when you take that banana plantation and you look at the reduction in pesticides the reduction in herbicides, the reduction in uh, fungicides, as well as the reduction in runoff that will be happening when it rains. There's no question that that sort of monoculture that's based on a healthy soil is vastly superior to a more mechan... We're actually an equally mechanized monoculture that's based on those inputs. Um, one, because it reduces his expenses. Two, it increases his, his resilience to a certain degree. And three, because you don't have all of those toxins running off when it rains. So it's definitely a step in the right direction. Whether or not he could introduce, you know, a secondary or a tertiary crop into that system comes down to his ability to manage and to have the right people and the right know-how. And the more diverse you get on a large scale system, it tends to be the more expensive things are. Um, and I found this on, on my farm in Saudi Arabia where we, hi Elaine, it's good to have you back. We don't hear you yet. We don't the have you. must be booting up. So yeah, it's probably because uh, there's always that wait time when you show up and then the little voice says, you are in the webinar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But um, it's way harder to harvest the more diverse you get. And so there, at some point there's a trade-off between the logistics and the finance of it and the diversity part. Now, certainly a more diverse farm is going to be more resilient because if one crop fails, you've got a bunch of others to substitute for you. But it, it comes down to the numbers and the logistics on that. Yeah. And you saw Shane actually starting to do some of that when he, when his, I mean, think between his ginger plantings, he was putting, you know, um, spinach and a few other crops, you know, trying to have multiple crops in the same area, which is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, we were going to have Shane on. Like, unfortunately, it was a bit too late there in South Africa. But, but some of the, it's like two in the morning, I think. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. He said the most challenging thing is like initially start out with 50,000 tons of compost a year. That's a huge number. But by making better compost, you know, it shrank to, uh, what was it? Wow. Yeah, 4,000 or. But that was great. Um, I kind of just went on a rant there. I forgot what I was talking about. 
<laughs> I've, got, I've got to duck out. All right, thanks, um, Neil. But thanks to everyone. The 240 of you that are still on, that's awesome. Uh, I am going to be back for the Q&A on Monday. I think I, also, I have some meetings in San Francisco I'll be attending, but I should be able to pop in at least. Um, but thanks to you, Brian, for being on. It was great to hear your story. And um, if we can't figure it out with Elaine today, we'll we'll get to it on Monday. All right. So I'm um, out. From thanks, Take Neil. Join us. Let's thanks. all send uh, positive technical magic towards Elaine. So <laughs> I think can be figured out. Oh, I'm I'm seeing something pop up. I think she'll she might be good here in a second. <laughs> But we'll continue to answer questions. As long as people are here, we'll keep <laughs> answering questions. Um, wait, let me go back to questions. Here we go. So here's a there's a few questions about compost tumblers. And Elaine <laughs> in, in the classes, she's talking about this is not a good system to use. Compost tumbling is essentially not doing the process right. So Brian, what, what was your experience? Like why why are you saying compost tumblers are a bad idea? Yeah, and I think you were talking about the handheld or the device you sit in your backyard and you tumble it every so often uh, type of thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I personally have not used a tumbler, but I have family members who have. Um, and a lot of the times my impression of those tumblers is they don't allow for good oxygen, um, that they go very anaerobic um, in there. And you're also not turning the pile based upon that kind of time and temperature and moisture you're just arbitrarily turning that um, that compost in the, in the tumbler. So it, for me, it doesn't give me the right feedback. You know, I, I like to be able to stick my thermometer in, check the moisture, and then turn it. And, and you know, typically in the thermophilic uh, pile, you're going to turn your pile on average five times. Um, you know, and that's kind of what you're, you're trying to shoot for. If you turn it less than five times, uh, you may not get everything to the hot center. If you're turning it more than five times, you probably got too much of a nitrogen source that's causing you to turn it that much. And um, you're also, you know, not allowing the fungi to really establish very well because you're turning it so much. And I think in those tumblers, that might be a, a disadvantage for the fungi as well. That if somebody's out there tumbling it every single day, um, you're not allowing things to, to the fungus to really start to establish. Okay, so Elaine, this is this is for you if you can hear me. So it sounds like I can't turn you on because it says your audio is off. So maybe if you plug out, if it's USB, plug it out and plug back in, or connect it, log out and log back in because maybe that will help it kind of automatically uh, get your your audio synced. So if you can hear me, that's my advice. Till then, we'll continue to answer questions. <laughs> <laughs> Till Elaine one day will become unmuted. <laughs> I, know it's I know it's frustrating for a lot of folks because there's burning questions to answer Elaine. Like, what do I do on my 32,000 acres of rot leaf? Please, Elaine, you're the only one who can help. Um, okay. Oh, that's a good one. Dang it. Elaine asked if she has to be unmuted. Uh, yeah, she is unmuted right now. She's, I guess, she, the headphones are having trouble connecting to the webinar. Yeah. Okay. Is there a way to connect those who are attempting to increase the scale? Do you mean, Tara? Do you mean um, connecting people who are who are doing large scale soil restoration? Yeah. Give me, give me a bit more context below if if you're still there. Okay. So here's a, here's a follow-up from Lucas for you, Brian. He says, I agree with Brian, but I would add diversity of plants would maintain a strong biomass and a diversity of soil microbes on long-term scale. Uh, it's kind of a long question. Diversity of plants that hold certain ecosystem functions would keep would keep a diverse set of microbes alive. You have more in, uh, so you have more intervention work to do every season to maintain a healthy diversity, which creates resiliency. Resiliency is climate change is key. Do you agree? So about diversity helping your soil biology, et cetera, et cetera. For sure. You know, one of the things we, we're always trying to strive for when we're making compost, or we're really what we're trying to strive for when we're looking at the soil is do we have the right amount of diversity of microbiology to really foster the plant health and bigger 
that the plant needs. And some of the things you're going to find when you, know, when you go through the, the Life of the Soils class is you're going to learn about this interaction about the plants and how they work with the soil biology. So in many cases, the, the plants are going to push out food resources into the soil. And so you've you got to ask yourself this question. Why would a plant go through all this effort to create all this energy, you know, sugars, proteins, amino acids, and so forth, and then push that, that out into the soil? I mean, what would be the purpose of that? And really, it's to feed the microbiology uh, in the soil. And really, what the plant is asking for in trade is saying, I'm going to push food resources out and try to grow this biology. But in the same aspect, I want to be able to get nutrients back. Because the plants have a much more difficult time mining the soil for the nutrients that it needs to use to sustain its life. It's very good at converting and making carbon. It can take CO2 with photosynthesis and boom, you got lots of carbon. Well, it can push those carbon sources out into the soil. Um, and having a diverse set of biology means that when the plant is going to push out exudates, it may say, you know what, I'm getting ready to go to fruiting and I need copper. So before I, I start to put on fruit, I'm going to start to try to feed the microbiology in the soil that is really good at mining copper. And so it's going to try to increase that nutrient cycling for the nutrients that it needs. If the biology is not there and it's not diverse enough, it's pushing out those exudates, but it's not getting necessarily all the copper that it needs or the molybdenum or whatever the, the micronutrient that it needs at that time frame. So by having a diverse set of biology, you know, available to the plant that at different times in the plant's life cycle, it's able to foster the biology that it needs, get the nutrients that it requires, and then grow and, and do its life cycle. So I hope that answered the question, but diversity of biology and soil is very, very key. And, you know, my food forest example that I use where, you know, I have a diverse set of plants, those diverse set of plants are also helping feed a diverse set of biology that's there and maintain that, that large diversity. Um, in monocultures, it's a little bit more difficult to do. Um, but, you know, that's why we make compost and compost teas and, and really try to, to foster uh, in creating that soil biology. And, and after a while, it's when you get the organic matter in there and you get the biology to establish, then year after year, as long as your management practices are good, um, your need to add additional compost or compost tea should decline or diminish. So Tara, uh, so connecting with other large farmers, one thing that's immediately you can do with this is uh, everything that's going to be sent out is going to be a chat log. So you can look at the chat log and find all of these people who are like, I have questions about 35,000 acres, 2,000, you know, dairy farm, 10,000 acres, whatever. Like you can look at the chat log and you can see their email and you can essentially email them right through the chat log um, when we send that out to you with the replay. Um, another thing is Environmental Celebration Institute. I, I think they do log some of these things and you can reach out to Carol Rollins or their support team, Jennifer at Environmental Celebration Institute, and they might help you connect. But, you know, a lot of this, you know, it's, it's tough because it's not like this immediate network, you know, because you can join Facebook groups, but sometimes people are just posting about bullshit. Um, but you want to, you know, if you want to reach out to someone directly, this, this chat log might be a great resource to find people who are here who are interested in it because, you know, there's 500 people in here and maybe a third of those are farmers that are doing the same thing you are. So check for that chat log later. And Tony's saying, how many countries are on here participating from? Yeah, there's all over the world, Saudi Arabia, Australia, U.S., U.K., uh, Canada, everybody's on here, every country, it's all represented. Uh, yeah, look in the chat log because some of these guys are talking about Australia in here. Yeah, I, I know we I wish I could have some big networking, like a map. You're like, okay, boom, you go to Australia. Boom, you go to New Zealand. Boom, you go to the U.S. Maybe that's coming one day. And uh, maybe we'll make a mastermind too. One thing I would add just to that, um, to the comment that Tara made about how you connect, you know, farmers together. You know, one of the, the functions of us as soil life consultants, what we're trying to do is actually – a, you know, we're trying to get connections with farmers so that we can help, you know, them transform from conventional to biological. But one of the ways we do that is to actually go to different groups, you know, the county extensions. A lot of, you know, in our area, the counties put on different um, uh, groups or sessions for farmers and trying to get our, ourselves to be able to talk in front of those folks and, you know, 
get the base set of knowledge so that people start to understand that there's a different option uh, is, is a key thing. So I think the more soil life consultants that start to really come online and start to get engaged more with their local environments and trying to make those connections, uh, the more this is going to grow. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm trying to help Elaine at the same time. Sure, sure. So, um, so, so I see uh, Lucas had a follow on. He said, "Yes, yeah, sorry, I badly put earlier. What I mean is, monoculture can work with addition of good biology on the long term due to lack of plant diversity and, and nitrogen fixers, dynamic accumulators, nectary plants, etc. Diverse systems can keep the diverse set of biology alive. Y I think diverse systems are much, just like I said, much better able to." foster and maintain their diverse set of biology. Monoculture, you struggle a little bit more. And that's where you have to really pay a lot more attention to your management practices, making sure that you don't till, making sure that you do leave, you know, uh, residue on the soil so that it can break down and add organic material and feed the, the, the microbiology when you don't have plants that are in a productive or an active phase. You know, if you're talking about annuals, you may not have anything in the soil at the time frame. If you're talking about perennials, there are periods of dormancy versus periods of activity. So, um, yes. All right. Awesome. Yeah, man, uh, this is the worst day for tech. Okay. <laughs> there's I another question here from, from okay. She can't hear us. Okay. Oh, there's, uh, okay. This is the situation, everybody. Comcast and the entire, in the entire area is down in all of Corvallis. So from the co-working space to her house, Comcast essentially went down. So no. she's having a hard time unless she has a hotspot. So she says, tell everyone I'm very sa sorry about not being able to do the Q&A. So I apologize, folks. If you had questions for Elaine, um, you can come back Monday. We'll definitely answer to them. We'll have a longer session than we normally do. Again, apologies. Sometimes things happen that you can't control, like Comcast goes down in the whole town. Uh, but yeah, again, I see people here I know who are amazing. Susan Cousineau is a... a a rock star with soil biology and and definitely ask again on Monday. Oh, Elaine's calling. So Brian, can you take a few questions while I talk to Elaine? You bet. Okay. Um, so there was a question here from Karen, which said, um, how does your system compare to a mulching system like the Paul Gouch's Back to the Eden Garden or Ruth House Hay Mulch? Um, so I, I actually, you know, like the Back to Eden Garden from Paul, um, I use wood chips a lot um, as far as a mulching uh, material, especially for new environments. Like if I'm going to put a new orchard in or I'm going to put a new garden bed in and so forth, um, I will use wood chips as a mulch uh, quite a bit. And, you know, Ruth Sout's idea here with the, the hay mulching is still you're adding residue on top of the soil that allows then the biology there to consume it, transform it, break it down and make it available to plants. So, um, yeah, mulching is a major component of what I do. In fact, that food forest I was mentioning, I grow some specific plants just for mulching. Uh, there's a plant called a Jerusalem artichoke, which is really, it's a tuber in the ground. It grows a, you know, six foot tall stalk, kind of looks like a sunflower. And um, I grow those because they will grow a lot of biomass that I can chop, I can drop, I can add it on my soil. Um, comfrey is another one that I use uh, a lot as well. And it is another fantastic mulching plant. So one of the things I, you know, I think is a good methodology is find sources of mulching that you can put on, but then also grow mulches that you can chop and drop and also use living mulches. So some of the work that Elaine's been doing at the research farm is looking at different types of ground covers that you can plant in annual gardens uh, that provide that kind of mulching experience. So one, it's not bare soil. So you're not evaporating moisture out. Um, the plants themselves keep kind of a humid layer at the soil level so that it doesn't evaporate nearly as much. And the plants themselves are also in this cycle of growing and dying back, growing and dying back at the root level. And that's still adding more organic material into the soil. So as long as you're not growing plants that really compete at a root level, like very competitive and try to choke out or compete plants, uh, living mulches are a fantastic uh, thing to use as well. Uh, there was a question up here from Igor that I wanted to address. Did you have an update? Yeah, so Elaine just wants to thank everybody for showing up. Again, uh, 
uh, you'll we'll have a link to another. For, just catch, check your replay email because we'll send you a link to uh, Monday Q and A session for folks who you know have burning questions that they want to answer to Elaine. Join us again on Monday. It's going to be the exact same time as this, uh, and you'll get the questions. And, and Brian, thanks, man. Thank you for sticking around for so long and yeah, answering awesome. questions. That wasn't part of the original deal, but because imagine if there's a room with like two, you know, <laughs> 240 people here and like the speaker is taking out and you're, all, you're in and you're like, okay, I'm filling uh, in for Dr. Lady. <laughs> yeah. Those are big shoes to fill in for. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> but I, you know, I thank you for having me here. And, and I, yeah. you know, like I said, I want to be able to try to get the word out as much as anybody. So, um, and share my knowledge. So if I'm able to do that, then fantastic. Yeah, awesome. Well, how about this? We'll answer a few more questions, answer the ones you want to do, and then okay. we might uh, cut the recording and like invite everybody back on Monday for another session. Here's, so here's let's, do, let's do two more. How's that? Is it, Three more? Out for you? you got it. Three two more. more. Let's do two more. All, right. Yeah. All right. So, so um, Igor had one a question in here. It said, is there any type of bedrock which is intrinsically lacking some nutrients and therefore couldn't be available to plants even with the right soil biology? And so the answer to that question is no. Um, and that shocked me, actually. Um, when I went through the Life in the Soils class, um, you know, uh, Dr. Ingham was going through and, and, and looking at a breakdown of mineral content of the soils around the world. And, and some soils are lacking or have much different proportion of certain minerals than others. So you may say, wow, this, this soil has almost no calcium in it, um, and, but this other soil has a ton of calcium. And it could be the same with iron or copper or molybdenum, whatever the, the mineral components are. But then you look at another side-by-side -side comparison of what do the plants require during their, their life cycle. And even though the calcium in one soil may have been very, very low, it's still enough calcium in that, that, uh, the soil to be able to, to drive the, the, the functions of the plant. And, um, so the, the, the long answer to the question is, is, or I think what a lot of people are getting to is, do you need to add amendments? Do I need to add, you know, rock dust or some other mineral components because my soil is lacking? I did a soil chemistry and it says you're way below average on calcium. Mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily uh, work out that way. It may be very low on soluble calcium or, or exchangeable calcium, but the mineral components there. And if you've got the right soil biology, it will mine that calcium from the soil. So there is not known to be a soil that's out there that doesn't have the necessary ingredients to support life. Uh, which means that you shouldn't have to be adding, you know, these mineral components as long as you've got the right biology to be able to mine those nutrients from the soil. Yeah, that, that's a point Link keeps hammering home again and again and again because it's just so important to understand that the biology will unlock these nutrients. It's not going to be some additional amendment. It's going to be repairing the biology. Protozoa, nematodes, fungi, and bacteria are going to unlock that biology for your plants. It's it's exactly. so cool. It, it takes so long for me to get these things through my thick thick skull, but once <laughs> through it, it's like, oh, I didn't realize this before. It's, you know, yeah. no one's teaching this stuff. It's it's great. Well, people are teaching it, but you know, you got you got to hear it so many times before you actually understand it. Exactly. Um, here we go. Certification process question from mm -hmm. this Lucas. So he's asking Brian, how's the certification process? Uh, the certification process is fantastic, um, and I'll tell you it's intense. Um, you know, I, I think Dr. Ingham and uh, Carol Ann uh, have really put together a program that pushes the Soil Life consultants to really prove their mettle. Um, it's not, uh, you know, just an easy pass through, hey, you took the classes, now you just do a project and off you go. Uh, there's a lot of interaction that you have to work with a mentor. Um, you have to be able to prove out, you know, part of the way the certification process works is there's multiple steps. The first step is you have to prove that you can make a compost. And so you've got to be able to do all of the data collection and prove that, that a, you can source the right materials, you know how to mix your piles, you know how to actually get the right level of moisture, and you can create a compost pile that has the right type of biology to, to you know to really accelerate plant growth. Step three uh, in in the process is to go through and make good compost tea, 
So it's it's great. You make good compost, but now you have a whole different practical application of making good compost tea. And, and it, there's things you have to pay attention to. It's not just as easy as have uh, some water and a brewer, throw in some compost, add some food resources, and voila, 48 hours later, you've got fantastic compost tea. Um, there's a lot of uh, understanding about, well, what kind of compost tea are you trying to brew? How are you trying to fine-tune this for the type of plant that you're going to be putting this into? And so part of the certification process, you need to be able to prove out that you have that capability to be able to do that work. And then the last part of the certification process is to actually do a project um, where you're going to, to actually transform a plot of land uh, from something that was either conventional or, you know, maybe wasn't um, didn't have all the soil biology and that you were able to apply your compost, your compost teas and the right management practices to be able to change from maybe uh, dirt or very poor soil to something that is thriving with the right levels of biology. Um, and, it, you know, it's it's really, really good that they make us go through that because ultimately all those steps that, that you go through to get to that end point are all the things that you're going to do for your clients anyways. And so you need to have confidence to be able to go into your clients and tell them, um, yeah, I I can do this and, and, and let me look at your environment and I have all the right tools available to me to be able to tell where you're at today and I can tell you where we want to be and then we can monitor that and, and show your clients that, yeah, we were able to, to move you to the right direction. And, and I find with most of my clients that I have, you know, the soil reports, you know, the, all the microbiology analysis and all that kind of stuff, doing the soil, you know, like finding the compaction layers, that's all good. They like to, to know that information. But when they see their plants produce twice the amount of volume and they do a bricks measurement on their tomatoes and go, wow, your these tomatoes are twice as sweet as the other tomatoes. To them, that's how they communicate with their, their customers, right? It's the food that they grow. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastic process to go through, um, and it, it is a no-joke thing either. It, it's well worth the effort that you put into it. So hopefully I answer that. Cool. Great. So why don't you pick the, the last question, unless that was the last question. Oh, okay. oh and let's see. Follow up uh, is like, are you going? Are you doing this full time? Uh, okay. Yeah. So my story is I'm almost done with my uh, my certification. I am, you know, at the very tail end of my project. So I've already finished my final project. I'm just putting the data together and actually ready to submit my project. Um, just a personal part about my life is that um, I've worked in the high tech industry. So for the last 20 some odd years and um, I am this year will be retiring from the high tech industry and running our soil biology consulting business full time. I'm already doing it part time and boy, it's a lot of work you know, to try to maintain a full time job and do the soil biology consulting aspect of it as well. But I cannot wait actually to retire from my current position and do this actually full time. It is absolutely a passion for my for me. And then yeah, the, the following is how long did, did it take for me to go through the certification process? Uh, I've been at it from the start when I took classes to this point now. It's been about two and a half years for me. Um, I know other people that have gone through it faster, uh, especially you know people that, that um, weren't maintaining a homestead and, and doing you know a nine to five job and all that kind of stuff. And I know people that, that are right about the same level three years uh, through the certification process. So. Um, it's really up to you as far as how much work you put into it. Just know that you probably need at least a year in the certification program because you have to do a project, which means you're, you're typically starting, you know, in fall and you're going through the winter and spring and you're monitoring through the summer time frame. So it's usually a year to go through your project. Yeah. You have to show a project and you know that your skills are at the point where you could re replicate this anywhere before they would consider, you know, recommending you to s somewhere else. But you know, like Vivian had the same story. Like she went through the classes, but you, you don't have to want to become a consultant to go through the classes. Like Shane just was like, this is going to be hugely useful yeah. on my farm. And so, bam, it's like the perfect marriage. Like, and, and that was like Charlie Weeb had the same story, uh, you know, that 50, uh, 50 hectare peanut farm. But, you know, working full time, you know, working on his farm full time, taking classes on the side and implementing this as fast as he could because, you know, it's like, okay, this has potential because what do I have to lose? What do I have to lose by doing this? Yeah. And yeah. You know, I'm, I'm learning. It's like, I just think, man, this is so cool. It's like the potential is there even on 
my backyard. I could do it in my neighborhood. I could grow like pumpkins and squash on the side of like all these areas simply by, you know, repairing the soil biology. And, you know, examples of what you do about compaction and pests and, and toxic chemicals. It's, it's great. It's just awesome learning about all this stuff. Cool. Well, Brian, if you got to get going, I totally understand. You are a champ. A champ <laughs> for three hours. I appreciate your time. Appreciate you helped me answer some questions. I, I made one of my first backyard piles, and I, I asked him some questions about it. I was like, where do I get organic uh, alfalfa? But he, he was like, get beer mash, and that was that was a good idea. Yeah, yeah, beer mash is great. I there's so many I mean, craft brews, at least in California, and I know pretty much in the United States that they've really taken off. But it's a byproduct of the brewing process. They have all the spent grain, and it's a fantastic high nitrogen source. Mm -hmm. Nice. Oh man, I wish I could answer some of the questions. Like Jay Valencia yeah. on a slightly slippery, on a slight slopey property in New Mexico. Would the burn and swale along with basic roof harvesting of water help? Should I pond up the lower points of the hill and pump it up and around? Yeah, that's a lot lot to that for sure, that yeah. question. Um, water management, um, yes, swales are great. Um, you know, moving water from the top and let it, you know, penetrate into the soil and have that water plume underneath, you know, move down through that slope is fantastic. So anytime you get water up the top and then have it again, absorb and move down through is great. But the way to also, you know, enhance that even more is making sure you have a lot of good organic matter in the soil so that those aggregates can actually hold and maintain that, that moisture. So, yeah. um, but that, that question definitely is something that would take a little while to unpack. <laughs> yeah, so can, so can a grain bash be used instead of manure in addition to? Um, I, so I will make compost with manure, um, and I will make compost without manure because there's certain clients that are doing market gardens, and they're very concerned that they don't want manure sources. Um, and so beer mash is a fantastic. And to be honest with you, I find – that the beer mash is um, is equally as good as the you know chicken manure or the manure sources I've been using. So awesome! Yeah, that was one thing. Elaine O'Reilly, Ryan, if you got it going, I totally said just click uh, file and then leave webinar, and then you'll leave. I, I might stick around five more minutes and just okay. take everybody All out. Right, well, thank you, everybody. I appreciate the time, and um, hopefully, I'll see some of you guys as colleagues and as soil life consultants if not enjoy the classes so yeah awesome and please, right. like uh, we'll send brian's we'll attach brian's email too if you want to get a hold of them and uh brian sure. send me your website if you got one so we'll i put it in the thing i have a facebook it's sprouting soil and um awesome. it, from the facebook account it has my email address and so okay, forth. You cool. can get a hold we'll, we'll attach that will be a picture of you and it'll be like click his picture <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly all right good. thanks Raleigh. appreciate it bye awesome. everybody Thank you, everybody. Yeah, uh, Carpagam, you can totally get Brian's information. And what else was I going to say?